Please uh, take a seat. We are starting uh, shortly. Thank you. Should I ask a bunch of you? Hello. Uh, my left. Oh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Franco Pavoncello. I am the president of John Cabot University. And I'm happy and honored to welcome you and our distinguished panelists to the presentation and discussion of the book, We Have Always Been Cybers, by our good JSU professor of philosophy, Stefan Zogner. This is an important book that offers a thought-provoking analysis about our future in light of the growing interaction between humans and machines, but also with an eye to our past and to the ways we grow and prosper. Is in fact, Sogner asks, the growing interaction between humans and machine a qualitative break from the past for humans? Or is this a process 
a continuum of our own evolution, evolutions as cyborgs. Self-steering organisms, they use technology to improve their power and well-being, whether by acquiring a language as children or knowledge and tools in our education. Is this part of an evolutionary continuum or a cosmic jump into a more or less dystopic future? Sogner also argues that this transformation, man, the growing interaction between man and machine, is part of a larger technological change characterized by the exponential massive increase of digital data about ourselves and the world around us, which is given to agencies that analyze and use those data, thus expanding our individual capacities and affecting our lives in every dimension, while creating, however, a fundamental tension between progress and well-being on one side and social control and individual liberty on the other. And these are only hints to the important questions raised by this very interesting book. But we're lucky today to have such a distinguished group of panelists and the author with us to discuss the significance and the many implications of this work. So I thank you very much for coming. And now I give the floor uh, to our moderator, Professor Sabaki. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pavoncello. It's a pleasure to welcome here, uh, you here in uh, John Cabot University. Our first uh, speaker is uh, Jennifer Merchant. Jennifer Merchant obtained uh, the, her PhD in political sciences from uh, Sciences Po Paris. And she's uh, now teaching at the Université de Paris uh, 2. Her research uh, privileges a multidisciplinary approach at the crossroad of political science, law, gender studies, and bioethics in Anglo American and European countries. Amongst her publications, uh, which are in French and English, is uh, Procreation et Politique aux États-Unis. Uh, 1965 to 2005. Um, Jennifer Merchant is currently um, working on two projects. The first one is analyzing from a comparative perspective policies relative to gender and healthcare and the research. And her second project is a comparative public policy uh, analysis of the framing of human genome editing and their impact on the future of human reproduction. She's also a member of the INSERM Ethics Committee and of the Institut Universitaire de France. Uh, Jennifer Merchant, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you, uh, Stepan, for your invitation. And thank you to the John Cabot University for this um, organizing and hosting us at, at this very interesting event. Um, I'm a political scientist. I'm not a philosopher. And um, therefore, I'm not going to comment on Stepan's book from the standpoint of a philosopher because I don't have that training. My training is in looking at the nitty gritty facts and details of institutions, political institutions, and how they impact on our societies today, especially in the realm of uh, human reproduction. And um, so what I'm going to do is um, sort of introduce this, this discussion with um, an invitation to all of you to think about these questions of access uh, as uh, Stefan discussed the potentials in the future of, or already existing, of being cyborgs and what uh, this is going to mean for us as humans in the future. Always keep in mind this, this idea of access, who's going to have access, because this is something that I am particularly concerned about. So I had a great delight in reading Stefan's book. Um, it, was, it was inspiring, it was stimulating, every, every page carried with it uh, very thought-provoking material. And there, as I said, I'll be incapable of discussing it from a philosophical standpoint. So I am going to uh, speak to it through the prism of political science. 
And in fact, on page five of Stefan's book, uh, there was already a challenge that you launched <laughs> to me. And I quote you, um, a main philosophical issue with which I will be less concerned here is that of transhumanist politics. The majority of intellectual transhumanists are in favor of a social democratic version of transhumanism. A complex social democratic version of a transhumanist politics has been published in Citizen Cy Cyborg by James Hugh in 2004. And I did some more research and also discovered other books that discuss the politics of cyber citizenry. And, and I'm going to uh, take uh, my inspiration from a book by Chris Hables Gray called Cyborg Citizen and, and deliver my, my reflections from that standpoint relative to Stefan's main themes. Uh, Gray's book presents a very interesting um, uh, introduction in which he uh, takes the Bill of Rights of the United States, uh, the first 10 amendments of the United States, which include the most fundamental uh, liberties that a citizen has, and translates it into a new cyborg citizen Bill of Rights proposal. So I don't know, maybe some of you have already heard of the existence of the genetic Bill of Rights. Um, the Bill of Rights sort of stands out as a, as, as a model on which we can achieve this social, human, uh, political system. So Stefan's sentence uh, that he was not going to discuss the politics of transhumanism has therefore inspired me to do so today in the short time that I have. Um, so Gray's book came out in 2002, and like I said, uh, uh, his, uh, his, his approach is to, is, to, is to imagine a cyber citizenry based on the Bill of Rights. His introduction, um, in his introduction, he wrote, you are a cyborg, get over it. The overdetermination of cyberjation sets the tone in this book, and it is one that I must emphasize is a thesis that I can easily adhere to in the meaning that is given by Gray and, of course, by Stefan. That is to say, in other words, uh, throughout the history and progress of science, we have, as humans, have always been not necessarily augmenting ourselves, but improving ourselves, even if you just think about glasses, uh, et cetera. Uh, I adhere to this approach of what humanity is or what human beings are. However, if I look closely at um, Gray's uh, Cyborg Bill of Rights under the political microscope, uh, there are a few um, problems that I, that I have with uh, this, this approach. The first is uh, Gray, um, posits that as a necessity for a cyber citizenry, corporations, business corporations, and other bureaucracies are not citizens, nor individuals, nor shall they ever be. Unfortunately, this is not the case today in the United States of America since 2010. In the United States Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, the US Supreme Court argued successfully that business corporations could be considered as persons and therefore be uh, allowed to contribute as much financial contributions to whatever candidate they would like to. This was not the case prior to 2010. In addition, another decision by the U.S. Supreme Court a few, a few years later in 2014 called Burrell versus Hobby Lobby declared that corporations could also claim religious expression, liberty of religious expression, which is found in the First Amendment, and therefore refuse uh, to adhere to the law. And this example had to do with Obamacare and with the fact that in Obamacare, which was the health care program that Obama put into place, contraception, access to contraception was paid for. And one of these corporations in the borough um, and Hobby, Lo Hobby Lobby claimed that they were a, uh, an associate, a, a corporation that was run, run by people who were religiously inspired. And their inspiration um, included the fact that contraception was not allowable, and including uh, contraception and abortion. And therefore, they claimed that they had a religious liberty uh, option based on the First Amendment not to provide in the Obamacare of policies that they were offering their employees, the possibility to pay for uh, uh, contraception, access to contraception. And this is now the case today. If a corporation defines itself as being religiously inspired, 
they can get out of a certain number of laws or a certain number of, of, of uh, programs that the federal government in this case has put forward. Um, if I then look more closely at some of the other um, rights that a cyber citizen would have under the framework of the American Bill of Rights uh, text that Gray refers to, another uh, very interesting um, aspect uh, comes to mind when I read uh, a, a few of them. The first, uh, the first right that uh, Gray refers to is the that citizens, cyber citizens, should have the freedom to travel. And this, uh, of course, he bases this on a juridical analysis of the rights. I won't get into that. But uh, at the end of uh, this particular right, as well as others, and I'll mention them, um, there is the mention of at their own risk and expense especially expense. In other words, the freedom to travel is should be absolute, but there's no, there's no subsidy for that. You, if you can afford it, you can do it. If you can't, then don't be. Um, the next uh, freedom that uh, Gray refers to is the freedom of electronic speech. So I find this to be a little bit in contradiction with a subsequent one, but I'll get to that later. He argues that under the First Amendment, um, their freedom of speech, freedom of expression should be absolute. Well, such is not the case today. In reality, um, in the United States, freedom of speech is subjected to five limits that the US Supreme Court has set out in its jurisprudence over time. Um, another issue that this raises for me, um, freedom of electronic speech, is of course what we've seen um, recently or in the past decade, the problem of fake news. Uh, freedom of electronic speech, all right, but what about the impact of fake news and of people living in bubbles and get and who get their information from erroneous and, and false information? And the third uh, right that Gray speaks to is the freedom of electronic privacy, which I find is a little bit in contradiction with the freedom of electronic speech. Um, he argues that this is protected by the Fourth Amendment, and it is true that privacy is uh, protected by the Fourth Amendment and other, other amendments as well. However, um, I'll just give you one example of how this right to privacy is compromised by our current situation. Uh, France has a uh, genetic uh, data uh, program called uh, the French Data Health Hub. And recently, because there were there was there were no longer there was no longer any more space in France to collect and store this health data, they uh, entered into a contract with Microsoft, and um, and this is a, a business contract. They entered into a contract with Microsoft, and now Microsoft owns and stores uh, millions and millions of, of health data relative to French citizenship. The fourth. Uh, and I'm almost done. The fourth uh, freedom that Gray points to, and that I, as I argue here today, challenges a little bit uh, what um, Stefan has put forth in his book, is the freedom of consciousness. And this is something that I cannot address, but my question would be directly to Stefan, how do you define consciousness? Uh, Gray argues that this is uh, protected by the first, fourth, and eighth amendments. I argue what is the definition of it? And also he adds at the end of this particular freedom, the freedom of consciousness at their risk and expense. So I see, I see a difficulty in, in conciliating uh, these two aspects from the standpoint of this freedom, which uh, is argued and the reality of what happens. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, the right to life, the right to death, is argued as being an individual decision. We had a conversation about this yesterday, about freedom of being able to decide individually for a number of things. And again, at the, uh, as, a, as, a, as a condition for these right to life and right to death freedoms, um, Gray argues that this is, again, at your own risk and expense. So again, uh, if you can afford it, <clears throat> or uh, or if you're taking risks and something goes wrong, you have no recourse. Um, another right that, um, and which is very dear to me, that Gray puts forward, and which I see as a as problematic, is the right to political equality. Um, 
I'm just thinking recently of the French elections. In order to become a candidate, so the, the idea is that we are all equal, we are all represented, we are all represented, and in elections, and elections are free, and everybody, one man, one vote. But recently in, in France, we are, we are going through presidential elections right now, and what is interesting to look at in detail <clears throat> is how do you become a candidate? Well, in France, to become a candidate, a candidate, you have to have 500 mayors uh, or 500 political notables sign on to a list, and that gives you the legitimacy and the legal uh, right to become a candidate. However, if you look at some of the, um, uh, if you look more in detail, for example, Anne Hidalgo, who is at the Socialist Party, she is barely under 2% in the polls of being able to win, but she achieved the list of sponsors very quickly because the Socialist Party was very well entrenched and present um, regionally and across the country. Whereas other candidates who were more popular, who are more popular in the polls than she did not get their 500 signatures. So this asks, this, you know, this requires us to look a little bit at the functioning of political institutions and who has the right to uh, access the institutions or not. Freedom of information, I fully agree. Freedom of family. Um, so these are the two rights that Gray really insists upon. Um, I, I fully agree and saw no, no problematic with that. Um, and the last uh, freedom or right that Gray puts in his Cyborg Citizen uh, Bill of Rights is the right to peace. We all have, uh, argues, he argues, uh, the right to peace. That there should be no such thing as local militia and we should only have the right to defend ourselves with deadly force. And again, he adds, at our own risk and expense. And so I'm thinking of what's going on in Ukraine right now. Um, if I understand very correctly, then the Ukrainians would not have a right to, um, well, they would, they would have a right if they were individually menaced or threatened uh, by deadly force, but they would not be allowed to organize in the military groups that they have been organizing in. So that's the end of um, my critique of Gray's book. And so what I'm inviting Stefan to do is, if he can, briefly address uh, some of these inconsistencies that I find with trying to put into place a, cyb a cyborg uh, citizenry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. You can also stay, then we can have a discussion, I guess. Um, yeah, what what Craze book is actually, I mean, he's put together a couple of of, of 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 rights which he has stressed from. This was put together 25 years ago, so it's been really a, a long time ago. What he did developed actually within the transhumanist discourse didn't have such a big impact, even and and it's clearly what he presents is a, a lot of in, um, inconsistent um, inconsistent positions. And but that's not um, representative of the transhumanist discourse. I mean, in the transhumanist discourse, there's a wide range of perspective. On the one hand, you, we see some extremely libertarian positions, which are representative sort of for the Sil Silicon Valley transhumanists around Elon Musk, around Peter Thiel in particular, um, who, who really take negative freedom to their extremes. On the other hand, we see someone like James Book, the Citizen Cyborg book is one which you, which you mentioned, really who are more closely... Social democratic, maybe even communist. Well, bordering, but he still has a liberal basis. So the the, the range of the positions is is, is pretty broad. And um, what Cray represents is not something as a distinctive transhumanist worked out um, um, political political approach. Um, some of the most interesting, some of the most interesting challenges, I guess, what we now, what is are being discussed now. Are, are the issues concerning privacy, sort of mm. how privacy in our age, um, where digitalization, automation, we are entering the metaverse, you know, the from web 1.0, 2.0, now we're entering the web 3.0, and, and like the everything's becoming, so blockchain technologies right. are, represent the latest stage mm. of digitalization. And that's what we need to address. Um, are the issues sort of who, who owns the data? Who should have the right um, to get access to this digital data? And how should they be used? And, and here we really have, and this is what I was lying out in, in my book, sort of, we have got different approaches. Um, we've got on the one hand, the US American approach, 
which is which is very liberal, which in particular sort of favors the usage of the of the um, digital data on the basis of private companies, um, Facebook, Google collecting all the all the information and using it for advertisement purposes, using it in order to own the increase their own financial financial goals, and that's working extremely well. On the other hand, we've got the Chinese model, which basically forces all the companies, forces everyone working within China um, to give up all the data to the government. And so the, the Chinese government has a right to use all the data and only they have the right to use all the data within China. But in addition, there's a possibility of collecting all the data, maybe of Chinese companies who work outside of China, um, Huawei, TikTok, and so on. Um, Alibaba, and, and they also have to deliver their, 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 the digital data to the government. So they probably are the only country who has the right to collect the data in all different parts of the world. But, and if we, and the third player, which is still a player, but which, which makes me quite concerned is, is sort of the, is Europe and with, a, with the extremely rigid data GDPR. protection policies mm. and with a, with a high focus on privacy. Which we, which we have here. And you were asking the question concerning um, the uh, challenge of access, yes. access also when we talk about, about health, health issues. And, and in particular, in that respect, I'm extremely worried concerning the possibility of access to healthcare, to, to financing uh, public health insurance, which I think is just an more enormously wonderful achievement which we have here in Europe. Um, in, in contrast to the United States, where sort of um, 30 million people are not insured, don't have the possibility to take out in, insurance. Um, so, and, but, but sort of, it needs to be financed. The public health insurance needs to be financed, and you need a lot of money in order, in order to actually have a well-functioning public, public health insurance system. And the rigid laws, or the, 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 the enormous importance we place on privacy in Europe is actually a, a challenge for guaranteeing the access. If we take it for granted, if it's actually just, uh, just judgment, an appropriate judgment, that um, data, data is the new oil. Mm -hmm. I mean, data is not the new oil because oil is a natural resource and data, data is intellectual property. They are two different things, but they play the same function. Um, they are both to do with power, money, influence. And, and this is, um, and if we basically in Europe make it impossible to gather that digital data, personalized digital data, that will have financial consequences. And financial consequences insofar that we will not be able to provide the health, the public health insurance as, as we still can, mm. because the data will go to other countries, the data will, the, the, and the money will go to the United States, and probably even more important, probably. To China, and this will have enormous importance. That will reduce the uh, the well-being, the economic flourishing in Europe, and as a consequence, well, um, the first people who will have problems in that, who will face the consequences um, on the lack of economic flourishing, will probably be the middle class. Mm -hmm. And if the middle class, um, well. It realizes that it's no longer so well off as it used to be, or if it realizes that the flourishing progresses better in China, even relatively speaking, um, that will lead to a lot of discontentment. Discontentment means there are tensions within the society, and tensions within the society mean you look for a scapegoat, you look for someone to blame. And the scapegoat and someone to blame are the others, are the minorities. Um, and you know, that might even lead to a civil war in Europe because mm. there will not, if, if, if data is really so important as we take it to be. Mm. And that's why sort of the question concerning privacy and who's got the right of digital data is not disconnected or in other words, is directly connected to the question of access to public, uh, access to private health insurance. And that's why I in the book actually stress, no, um, we need to rethink, the most important question is, to rethink the meaning of digital data. And, and instead of, instead of um, we need to allow the government, and I have more trust in a, in a European government than I have trust in an American company, because an American company uses it for the sake of their own financial well-being and who has access to the data. 
Um, but here we've got some, you know, more rights-based liberal democratic systems. Um, and if they collect the data, if they collect the data, then it wouldn't have to be expropriation. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have to be the case that um, they, they take away simply our intellectual property if it is used in a democratic manner. But what does it mean to use the digital data in a democratic manner? It means the money which we gain from it needs to be used for something which is in our interest. And what is in our interest? That's a public health insurance. Most people cherish an increased health span. Um, most people, if we look at uh, psychological studies, most people identify an increased health span with better quality of life. Um, and that's why sort of collecting the digital data on a European scale within the European Union and then using the money for financing, for improving um, the public health insurance, that would guarantee the access. But that would mean abandoning sort of privacy, digital privacy, or at least reducing it. Because in the, in the way, the digital data would still have to be protected in the sense it would have to be collected but of course, if humans have access to it, then it's always the risk of abuse is enormous. And I'm terribly scared of that suggestion myself. Mm. That's why sort of once the digital data gets collected, it needs to be stored very safe and primarily processed, as I suggested, by, 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 by algorithms. And, and then we can use the digital data in a, in a democratic manner and use it to pay for a public health insurance. Mm. And I think that's sort of, I think one of the most important questions we are currently facing it when it comes to digitalization. Okay, can I just say something? Yeah. Just one minute. Once, I totally agree with you. It is one of the biggest challenges. And my, again, as I said earlier, access to public health for all for me is, is a primary concern. I'm wondering if it isn't too late already because I gave the example of um, Microsoft and buying, you know, um, to be able to store for France uh, a huge amount of, of health data concerning French citizens who don't even know it, as a matter of fact. And um, another aspect being that French people, for example, I don't know about Italians, but uh, because, and this gets to your point of pro prohibiting, French people who, for example, want to know their, their genealogy or, or children who are born of, of IVF and they want to know who their genitor is, um, they are sending their genetic samples to U.S. companies like 23andMe or, or, um, or Ancestry.com, and they consent to give their uh, information, their, their genetic data, to these companies, but that's the only thing they consent to. So for me, the, one of the huge problems is what happens about what happens when that data is then transferred without the consent of the original person who doesn't realize in many cases, many French people don't realize when they send the, their data to find out who their ancestors were, that once that data leaves them, which is not the case in France, um, once that data, because of the French bioethics laws, once that data leaves them, they have no more control about what is going to be done, done with it. And so there's a very perverse effect here because in France, the French people are not allowed to use the public health system to find that kind of stuff out. So they turn sort of what you might call medical tourism in, to, in a certain way, to places where they can, and then they lose control over their own data. So that is a huge channel at challenge, and I think it's a bit late. Professor Merchant, it has been a fascinating topic. I'm an historian and I mainly work on the Middle East, on Iran and Yemen, so I don't know anything about cyber, but I find it fascinating. And today I was reading while I was on the train from Turin, my hometown, to Rome, an article on the BBC about surrogate mothers in Ukraine. So one, that's one of the issues, so all the kids who are born during the war and uh, the families from Australia, from the US, from oh, Europe yeah. are unable to go and get them. And the different laws in different countries. So I would be very glad to get a copy of your speech and read it uh, carefully. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for uh, introducing me to this topic. Now is the turn for Rebecca Bamford. Uh, she's senior lecturer in philosophy in the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy, and Politics at Queen's University, Belfast. She has published uh, two books on Nietzsche, Nietzsche's Dawn and Nietzsche's Free Spirit Philosophy. Uh, Rebecca, the floor is uh, yours. You are online from uh, Belfast, I guess. 
Yes, from Belfast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, albeit virtually. I'm sorry about that. Um, to discuss Professor Silgner's excellent new book. Um, <clears throat> I will start with just saying something about what I particularly appreciated about the book, um, and then I'll develop a bit of a critical challenge, um, really more in the line of questions rather than severe criticism. So the thing that I particularly appreciated is Silgner's effort to bridge the gap between the history of philosophy and contemporary transhumanist philosophy and bioethics. Um, bringing historical and contemporary perspectives into meaningful dialogue as part of responding to current issues that, as the previous speaker mentioned, affect all of our lives, is incredibly difficult work to do at all, let alone to accomplish as well as I think Stefan does in this book. So with that said, um, the thing that I want to focus on is Stefan's use of Nietzsche's philosophy um, those of you who don't know me, I'm a Nietzsche scholar. Um, and what I want to do is try to develop the point that I think even more Nietzschean ethics than I think Sogner allows in the book is needed to open up space for transhumanist philosophy, including transhumanist ethics, to develop beyond the constraints of what Nietzsche in free spirit texts like Dawn referred to as customary morality, which we can think of as conventional or current forms of morality. So that's the trajectory of my criticism. Um, so let's start by thinking a bit more about Nietzsche's ethics. Um, in his response to Michael Sandel, um, I think uh, Stalkner runs into a little bit of trouble by trying to um, back off Nietzsche's ethics a little bit. So I'm sure everybody will remember that Sandel proposes that unconditional love should be the central virtue of parenting, since this virtue is the basis on which, according to him, parents accept their children as gifts. And what Sandel means by that is that children have varying capabilities or, or they're gifted in a range of ways all of which Sandel thinks are morally significant and precious. And our task as moral agents, Sandel thinks, is to appreciate the diverse ways in which children are gifted. So in challenging Sandel's ethic of giftedness, Sogner argues that grounding parenting in the virtue of unconditional love would inhibit children's flourishing. The excess of unconditional love might lead to problems of child development, um, and to an undermining of the development of responsibility. Um, he grounds his challenge to Sandel's critique of genetic enhancement, so Sandel's ethic of the gift is targeting the possibility of genetic enhancement, as we know, um, in Nietzsche's communitarian virtue ethics. In the interest of time, I won't say too much about how that goes, but I'll just say two quick things. Sogner connects Nietzsche's will to power ontology with his theory of aristocratic virtues or in Beyond Good and Evil, healthy virtues specifically tied to a healthier notion of aristocratic types, types of people. Um, and he points out Nietzsche puts forward education as a means to bring about the post-human um, and defends the view against Sandel that given epigenetics, Nietzsche implicitly affirms genetic enhancement. And I think Sogner makes a pretty good case that Nietzsche's virtue ethics can support that kind of critique of Sandel's ethic of the gift. But Sogner at the same time also says Nietzsche's communitarianism in which this virtue ethics is grounded is going to lead to a Gattaca-like dystopia if implemented. And to make that case, Sogner uses evidence from beyond good and evil, especially Aphorism 258, um, where he discusses the example of the matador vine. And if you're wondering why there's a tree behind me, you might be able to see there's a, a vine climbing the tree. And this is the, the kind of strangler vine that Nietzsche is mentioning in Beyond Good and Evil 258. Um, so Sogner uses this example to explain what Nietzsche thinks a healthy aristocratic community model looks like. So the, the vine climbs the oak of the, the masses, as it were, to, to reach the, 
top of the the tree canopy and ex express its strength and reach the sun. Um, and because he thinks this sets up a two class community, Sorgner doesn't use all of Nietzsche's philosophy. He doesn't endorse all of it, um, but he tends to pick the elements he thinks um, are important, but that don't lead him to adopt a communitarian politics. So he, he wants to separate out the ethics and the politics a little bit. Um, I'm not sure we can do that in reading Nietzsche, and that's partly my worry. And I'm specifically worried that it's difficult to separate out Nietzsche's thinking on the notion of community from his thinking on will to power, as Nietzsche claims elsewhere in Beyond Good and Evil in section 13, a living thing wants to discharge its strength, life itself is will to power. My worry is that trying to make that separation might undermine the appeal, the strategic appeal to only parts of Nietzsche's philosophy to, to try to motivate that challenge to Sandow. I'm also not sure about this claim that Nietzsche's philosophy understood holistically necessarily or inevitably leads to the Gattaca-like social structure with which Sorgner notes his serious disagreement and which if, if Um, she, she, she booked the flight to this morning at 6 o'clock from Belfast to London and then from London to Rome. And then when she got up, it must have been 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning, she received a message from British Airways telling her, well, someone hacked British Airways at Heathrow Airport and basically all the flights um, from British Airways were cancelled. So she was up there trying to sort everything out to realize it, that she can actually make it and come to Rome. She wanted to be here with us and meet uh, all of us here in person and to discuss these issues with us. Um, but basically it was impossible to get another flight and, and all the sort of, um, yeah, the British Airways flight has it, been hacked and many of the flights will simply be delayed for the next or late for, 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 for two days. Um, so it's, it's causing an enormous impact um, on the flight. I don't know whether she will get reconnected. So one of the questions, I would just want to respond to something which... Um, yeah. Oh, is she... Um, yeah, no, um, uh, uh, respond to one of the things. Yes, I... So Michael Sandel says, no, um, we shouldn't... Genetic parents are bad parents if they enhance their children. If they select children for specific children... Um, after in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. If you do this, then you instrumentalize the children, then you, then you use the children, but that shows something. It's not, it's not an immoral action, but it shows something bad about the parents. The parents are not good parents because they should possess unconditional love. They should just embrace whatever comes. Um, and, the, and the question was, so, so the con counter argument I was, I was presenting against Sandel was actually a bit multifaceted. I had, I, I, um, had several arguments against this perspective. And I guess the most important point is, can we actually embrace such a virtue ethical argument? Um, is that actually a very well thought out? Oh, I'm already... <laughs> Um, I was already sort of trying to preach the and uh, responding to, to one of your uh, uh, arguments concerning communitarianism. Um, I, let me just maybe I just finish off and then we enter into the dialogue. Um, then, um, well, the communitarianism um, is, is, is a communitarianism actually, is that something desirable? Is that something we want? Is that something which is in tune? With this, something which is in tune with sort of that liberal democratic foundation which we cherish, which we, which we aim for, which we value so immensely. And I think sort of, or, and, and because on the virtue ethics, sort of what is needed is a shared common understanding that unconditional love is an appropriate trait of all parents. 
A good parent has to embrace unconditional love. And, and so basically it needs to be communally shared in a, in a, in a community be shared by all of them that this is a, an appropriate virtue of parents. And I've, I've had presented different arguments as well, but I guess the most important argument for me would be, I wouldn't even affirm that a community is something which we should try to go for, that we should try to aspire for. Because in the end, the community which would be needed for, for a virtue ethics to function um, undermines the, you know, the negative freedom that we all can stick to our very own idiosyncratic drives and needs. Um, so the best we can aim for is just an affirmation of the value of, of, of negative freedom. But when it comes to, when it comes to virtues and so on, um, virtues function in small communities. They function in, in religious communities. They function in, in sort of political, cultural communities. And it's good that they're there. They're there, they combine, they represent the foundation. But once the community is all-encompassing within a country, that's dangerous. That leads to, you know, that probably even leads to totalitarian implication, at least strongly paternalistic implication. That's why I think any kind of strong communitarianism is something extremely dangerous and we should try to fight that as good as possible. And that would be sort of the most important argument actually, um, because basically Michael Sandandel's argument would presume uh, a communitarianism, which I think is extremely dangerous and undermines the achievements of a liberal democratic society. Back to, back to Rebecca, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. And uh, let me just then sort of finish my second point, um, which I think responds to what you were just saying, Stefan. Um, I think that I'm in agreement with you about the, the importance of a liberal democracy, personally. But I think to really do the work that we need to do to um, open up that space for transhumanism to develop, including in ways that actually fit with notions of liberal democracy, perhaps, or the, the full expression of that. Um, I think we need a bit more of Nietzsche's critique of conventional morality and the development of that new ethic that he reaches towards in the free spirit works. And my point was basically going to be that I think your emphasis on um, the idea of the overhuman um, isn't necessarily the one that if we switch the way that we look at the developmental trajectory of humanity that Nietzsche outlines or the potential for development isn't necessarily tied to the Ubermensch, so, so to speak. But we could go further than that and, and in different directions from that, particularly in our development of um, new ways of moral thinking that actually undermine that um, Sandow-like paternalism that you were speaking um, about when I managed to reconnect with you. So I think that the thing that I was missing from the book was um, more attention to um, Nietzsche's critique of customary morality versus his effort to motivate a new ethic. And that new ethic is something that can liberate us from some of the paternalistic constraints that hold back the possibilities, the transformative and potentially democratically transformative um, possibilities of transhumanism. So that was going to be my second point. Thank you. Now, I do agree sort of the, with sort of the criticism Nietzsche put forward, and I dealt with that in other, other writings. But here, what I wanted to present was a, a, um, sort of the, 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 the attacking aspects of Nietzsche in order to develop them further for a specific uh, transhumanist ethics. But what you said about post-human and, um, post and the overhuman and the ubermensch in Nietzsche, um, and in that, in the end, it's, it's I don't take a specific notion of the post-human or of the over or, um, um, of the post-human in, in a transhumanist sense. In the end, what the transhumanists here do, that's just representing you know, a specific anthropology, which means, well, 400,000 years ago, we were, you know, we became Homo sapiens. You know, now, now we've developed, we've developed further evolutionary. Six million years ago, you know, it, the Homo, Homo sapiens and, and great apes had the last common ancestors. In, will we still be around in 200,000 years ago? I'm sure we won't. 
So it's about, it's taking that evolutionary term, we will develop further. Either we will develop further or we will die out. And, and that has consequences concerning how we deal with emerging technologies, how we deal with biotechnologies and, and digitalization. So when I talk about the post-human, and also I, 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 this is how I read the over-human, it's an affirmation of an evolutionary um, uh, understanding of, of, of anthropology where all aspects of the human, there is no aspect which is not part of the evolutionary process. And once you start from that basis, that has consequences for our ethical self-understanding and how we evaluate influencing, genetically influencing, digitally influencing who we are. I think she froze again. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm here. Thank, yeah. thank you for that. Um, I'll just note um, one thing that I didn't get a chance to emphasize, which in response to your comment there is very much this sense that there's an issue of Nietzsche interpretation that I think you did a wonderful job in the book of addressing, but I think there's there's just a bit more to say to really um, make the most use of Nietzsche possible for the purposes of your project. So that's kind of where I, I end up with thinking about the role that Nietzsche plays in the support that you develop for your argument. And, and this is why maybe this addresses exactly that issue. Um, I don't think it would be good if a transhumanist ethics would turn into transhumanist politics because that would be as fundamentalist as, as if we had a, you know, a, 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 you know any kind of a, a Catholic, a Muslim politics, any kind of political foundation um, uh, which is rested on a, in a specific religion, in any specific world, in an atheist politics would be terrible. We need to have the openness. We need to separate we need to separate the political, um, so that this last is solution, the political from, from, from the ethical, the religious from the political. And that's why I don't want to go for, for Nietzschean politics, because the Nietzschean politics would be terrible too. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for joining us from uh, Belfast. I would like to give the floor now to Philip Larry. He's a priest from the Diocese di Roma and the Chair of Logic and Epistemology at the Pontifical, Pontifical Lateran University. He serves also as Chairman for the Humanity 2.0 Foundation. And for many years, he has been following the epistemological debate surrounding artificial intelligence from a philosophical point of view. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me go there. So that's the <laughs> I'm very grateful to Stefan for inviting me to speak on his, about his book and, and these themes. Although I teach philosophy at the Lateran University uh, many years ago, when most of you weren't alive, the Dean of Studies invited me to teach a course on the history of the church, which I did for, for many years. And then the Dean of Studies became the president. And uh, I, I was hired full time by the Lateran. But I I loved but the time that I spent here, what was seven or eight years, maybe? And to see how things have grown uh, is just really amazing. Uh, most of you come and you see everything already done, but uh, just imagine Franco in 2002, when, when this was just really a dream. And it was his dream uh, that wasn't always shared by the faculty. And so I remember there were uh, tensions. But anyway, uh, I think it's very unfair for Stefan to give us 10 minutes to talk about a book. Uh, <clears throat> I have a book out in, in called Artificial Humanity, and chapter four is on transhumanism. And I, I wish I had read Stefan's book before I wrote that. It would have been a lot different. But I, um, I, th I think it is, it, it's amazing how... Uh, and and this, was, this was mentioned at the beginning, how deep philosophical and even theological issues are now arising in a, a context of digital technology, artificial intelligence, and transhumanism. Stefan makes the point that most transhumanists are liberal, um, atheists, and uh, naturalists. And I agree with him on this. But I, I disagree that it's necessarily the case. 
and he mentions some some of the some of the people in his book uh, who actually founded the 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 movement, like Max Moore and his wife, like Nick Ballstrom. Uh, I interviewed Andrew Sandberg for my book, Connected World, uh, published by Penguin. Stefan has his book coming out by Penguin as well. I know Nick uh, Bostrom. I know Max Tegmark. Um, the with and Anders joke saying that they're the Swedish mafia of the transhumanists, right? Because the three of them are Swedes. Um, uh, someone that uh, that Steph I think should uh, perhaps give a little more attention to is Yuval Harari, the Israeli historian, because of his in influence in Silicon Valley. Uh, you speak about Elon Musk. You speak about. Uh, the argument of are we living in a simulation? He spends a lot of time on that. And I agree with what he says at the end, and it's it's irrelevant. You know, he says Bostrom may be right, and Nick Bostrom probably has a point here, and many theologians would agree with him that we live in a kind of simulation. Uh, from a Catholic point of view, reality is life after death. So Jesus tells us, that once we die, we there's an afterlife, and we're going to be judged on how we live in this life. So, if you if you like, from a Catholic perspective, this is a simulation. It's 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 almost a game. I don't like to use that word because it's a very serious game because we're free human beings, and the <clears throat> our condition in the afterlife is dependent on on what we do here and now. But the Buddhists, uh, Stefan mentions the Buddhists. Uh, one of the first humanists was a Buddhist. The, um, of course, nirvana and 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 life is a, a, a cycle, like Plato would say. You know, the transmigration of souls. Um, Islam, Mormonism. Go. Uh, uh, the, the Jewish religion is unclear. I think it depends on the rabbi, the schools of the rabbis that you speak with, whether or not there is an afterlife in the Bible. It, both possibilities. Are, are, are there. But almost every religion has a view about an afterlife. So in, in a sense, we are living in a simulation. Now, Nick Bostrom says it's a digital simulation, uh, uh, probably controlled by a, a, an alien civilization. And I think that that's an argument which is becoming very popular in cosmology and in and modern physics. Uh, but Steph doesn't get into that um, too much because he says it's irrelevant. I love that phrase. I think I, uh, no, I, I, I wrote I wrote this that phrase down, but I can't find it right now. Um, it, 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 in a sense, it doesn't matter. In a sense, it doesn't matter if this is a simulation. We're still living here, and we still present books, and we still uh, have to go to university. Some, what are some other issues that Steph brings up, which are. Um, completely philosophical in nature, uh, if not completely, almost. Immortality. So he spends a lot of time speaking on immortality and um, mind uploading, uh, which he disagrees with, and I agree with that. I, I, I think from an Aristotelian Thomistic point of view, mind uploading is not possible from a philosophical point of view because of the substantial unity between the mind and the body. And he mentions this non-dualistic philosophies like Thomas Aquinas. Interesting, this was mentioned before. Oh, no, um, Barbara? Rebecca. Rebecca, she mentioned how the history of philosophy, um, we can learn so much from past philosophical systems in order to frame issues which are coming out of Silicon Valley today, uh, like the nature of the human person. Stefan mentions this as well. I disagree that he says the, the nature of a human person is fluid, the Catholic Church says that it's a metaphysical reality, that there is a nature of the human being. We could talk forever about that. Immortality itself, um, Adam and Eve were created to be immortal. They should not have died. And death is a, is a result of original sin. Uh, Stefan mentions Francis Bacon, who says, through technology, we will overcome the effects of original sin. The first of all, the first of which is death. We will overcome, we will defy death through technology. Um, many people in Silicon Valley believe this. Uh, Stefan um, slights them a little bit. He kind of pokes fun at Elon Musk, but um, Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, spent $500 million creating a company for life extension. Jeff Bezos last year started Altos Lab, and he's throwing billions of dollars 
and hiring a lot of people to solve the problem of death, of aging. Stefan mentions this also. Aubrey de Grey, who Steph um, quotes quite often, uh, has a foundation in Virginia which is dedicated to eradicating aging. So these people are 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 not kidding. They're 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 they see death as the ultimate challenge, and they want to use technology to overcome it. Consciousness. What it, what is consciousness? David Chalmers says this is the 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 hard problem of philosophy. Uh, we we really don't know what consciousness is. Uh, we we can see it when we can know it when we see it. Uh, but then of course you have John Searle who, who's asking or Ray Kurzweil. Um, <clears throat> he's quoted several times in the book. What happens when a sophisticated artificial intelligence exhibits behavior which we consider conscious? Are we going to attribute consciousness to that agent? And I think we will. I don't think that the computer or the AI will be conscious, uh, just like computers don't feel anything and they don't know anything. That's just algorithms which calculate logical uh, equations very quickly. Uh, but they don't have emotions like we do. They're not going to be conscious like we do, but they'll be able to simulate it in a perfect way. That I, I, I do believe that that's true. And I think Kurzweil has a point. It, then we'll begin to attribute consciousness to those, to those agents. And we're not far from there. Um, let me end with just one example. Uh, <clears throat> we were talking about the metaverse. I, uh, maybe Steph and I will actually co-write a book on the metaverse because uh, Mark Zuckerberg is throwing a lot of money at this. And, um, and, and, and Francesco was here. Did, did he... He's gone. Well, Francesco and I were talking about this earlier. Um, Mark is betting on the metaverse because he probably sees Facebook as dying. Facebook is, is on its way out. And, and it's going to take 10 or 20 years for Facebook to go. But Mark is betting on the metaverse. He's putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into creating what, he's, what he thinks is going to be uh, – the way we spend most of our time in, in the metaverse. I'm hoping that he's wrong because I think it's an inhuman way of, of dealing with each other, but <clears throat> we, we can get into that later. When Stefan talks about uploading, uh, it, 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 uploading our mind, is it possible? Now, Elon last year came out with uh, an example of an implant uh, in a chimpanzee's head that allowed him to play a video game just by thinking of the moose. It, it, the computer learned as, as, he, as the chimp moved the joystick, the comp computer learned what the brain processes were doing to move the cursor. And then they unplugged the, 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 the joystick and the chimp kept on using it, but it was actually the, the, the brain signals that was moving the cursor. And then they took the, 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 the joystick away completely. So Elon toots this as you know, the next step brain computer implant. Uh, and, and he said that they're going to start uh, experiments on human beings this year. What he didn't say in the Wall Street Journal came up um, uh, a month later, 15 chimpanzees were killed uh, in order to perfect the implant. And several, they found several chimpanzees. This was in, in his lab in California, which was secret. Uh, several chimpanzees went crazy because their mind wasn't able to uh, handle the the way the implant was dealing with the brain. So <clears throat> it's I like Elon. He's I, we've invited him to our forum in in September, and I hope that he comes. I I think he's a visionary. I think he's an amazing amazing person. But as Sheryl Sandberg once said, uh, and she is the the COO of Facebook. Let's not leave the future of humanity to guys in hoodies. So I, I am glad that Stefan wrote this book. I, I think it's fascinating how we can speak about philosophical issues in a context which is completely different from any time before now. And um, I, I mean, if Stefan wants me to say more, more polemical things, I can, but I'd rather, I'd rather establish a debate and especially hear some of the questions or some of the, ideas from the from the auditorium. How does this fit into Catholicism? Sorry? How does this fit into Catholicism? Oh, well, Stefan says this in, in the book. Um, 
all of the, the nature of the human being, what is consciousness? Is there a soul? What is immortality? Is there life after death? These are all issues being debated by transhumanists. These were issues that most of us thought about from a religious point of view. And so uh, this is why Stefan is correct. Most religious people are not transhumanist because they've already begun to address these issues in a different context. But you certainly, you can have, I know several priests that are very involved in the transhumanist um, movement. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, and, 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 and initially you said sort of, I, I, I well, Deny the possibility of being religious and transhumanist. I do. I do not. No. Um, I think that was just a side comment. I, I'm not sure whether you, because I'm clear. Um, actually, I've, I've got a friend. He's a full professor of Catholic theology in Germany, and he's a transhumanist. He actually works on a transhumanism based on Klaus, a, a Hegel, Hegelian scholar of the beginning of the 19th century, who rather embraced sort of the panentheism. Panentheid, that everything is God is 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 mind and body interconnected, and though um, he doesn't take that um, dualistic essentialist understanding, um, which is sort of going back to Thomas Aquinas. So he he embraces an alternative view, and from his perspective, that is fully in tune also with Catholicism. Um, yes, but you, uh, you do make the point that the movement itself, exactly, you know, for exactly. Max Moore and his wife uh, Nick Bostrom. I mean, they're they're very clear about their philosophical yeah. presuppositions, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You Nick is that. an atheist. And I agree. No, I mean that's right. what the majority of people is secular, is naturalist, are skeptics, are atheists. Um, um, but it would be, and this is, I think, quite an important insight which one has to take into consideration on the basis of such a naturalist, on the basis. Um, of a, of a world understanding where everything's permanently in the process of change. There's no more that realm of absolute truth. And that's why even sort of the statement that, um, even the statement that naturalism is the ultra, ultimate response or that, um, or that any kind of monotheistic religion would be false could no longer be made. This is the important insight, any kind of truth judgment, which claims to present an ultimate truth in correspondence with, of the world, would have to become implausible. And that, yeah. that's a very interesting take, a very interesting development, I think, um, sort of also concerning, concerning uh, if one starts from such an understanding, and there are quite a few, there are Mormon transhumanist associations, there, there are Christian transhumanists, going back, Thierry de Chandeur is very much in June was, I mean, he yeah. used the word... Well, he was a Jesuit, so... <laughs> but, but he used it, he had transhumanizing, and he was a close friend of Julian Huxley, who founded transhumanism. Right. So right. Um, the question is actually a sort of, in how far, what, what would it have to be the implications if one starts from such a non-dualistic, non-essentialist anthropology, which is being affirmed by most, most transhumanists, what would have to be the uh, implications... So is there a necessary conflict with, with a monotheistic religion? I would say no. I mean, and showing because one cannot reject any monotheistic religion on that basis anymore. But what would have to be the implication, the consequences for, for how a type of religion, what we can affirm? And I think once it's impossible to, re, to make any rejection of, 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 or to claim any essentialist understanding of the truth, the best we would, we would get would be something what my I mean my, my doctoral supervisor was my exam was, was Gianni Vattimo. And oh. so he's a Catholic um, um, postmodern philosopher and he is sort of actually the moving away um, from the from the moving away from, from this essentialism and moving towards an ethics of autonomy which focus on the virtue of love and avoiding harm to others. Um, that could actually be a self, sort of the ethics of plurality which we have nowadays, that would be actually in tune with the teachings of Jesus Christ of the New Testament. I, and I can see that sort of that would be a way actually of how it could be in tune with the transhumanist understanding. Yeah, I think the, um, <clears throat> and Batimo is, is, is correct. <laughs> he has a whole 
uh, understanding of the theological ramifications of weak thought, which he, uh, which he developed. And kenosis, Jesus dies on the cross, is, is God releasing himself of, and St. Paul talks about this. So, th so there's a very strong theological uh, ramification of his work. I think you mentioned in, in chapter four, when you talk about ethics, uh, what do we consider as a flourishing life? And you make a very good point. Radical life extension will not make us necessarily happier. And, and these people need to understand that. I mean, these people, sorry. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, I mean, the Peter Thiels, the, the, the billionaires in Silicon Valley. It, just because you live longer doesn't mean you're going to be happier. So, so you make that point very well. I think where, where transhumanism might nudge religion is the meaning of life. And, and you speak about this in chapter four also. And the meaning of life from a religious point of view is to do God's will, is, is to understand your vocation and your historical context through the eyes of God or a divinity, if, if, if we're talking about Hinduism or something. Uh, and, and so what, what does a transhumanist think is going to be a meaningful life? So I, I would I would rebound the question no, no, to you. That's that's sort of the meaning of life. Is that's what I trust there? I, I think it, this would really take us very far if I now talked about that. But at least maybe one issue I wanted to address, without going to the meaning question, but still focus on, on the question of the good life. Yeah. Um, still an expanded lifespan, a healthy, a longer, healthy life is what most people identify with a higher quality of life. And so if we don't take their understanding, so I mean, sort of actually immortality seriously, which some people, which I think on a transhumanist basis, one shouldn't do either. You know, immortality in the literal sense cannot even conceptualize in this world. Um, however, living longer healthily is something, is something which, which, is, um, which most people identify with a better quality of life. And I, I think sort of this is, I, I, I had a discussion actually at a, at a German Katholikentag, the Catholic day with a, um, and, 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 and there was wondering, there were very strong hesitations about that. And I, I thought, well, actually, even if you, if based on the Bible, um, you, you read the stories um, sort of there, you know, now we've got an average life expectancy of 80 years. In the you find a many 120 year old um, people. Yeah. You find you find Methuselah. You find you Noah's know Noah's father. Is... 906. That's that's why Aubrey de Grey named his foundation after Noah's yeah. father. That's why there's still a bit of a gap. So even on that basis, so improving the health span would be something which is justified. No, using technology in order. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So um... but remember Michael Sandel's book, The Case Against Perfection. Yeah, I mean that's a prophetic book. That's a he said, where do you draw the line between and you mentioned this in the book on enhancements also where do you draw the line between ethical enhancements and non-ethical enhancements <laughs> now we've got a lot of philosophers are good at raising questions we don't necessarily answer them but <laughs> professor larry thank you so okay. much i I have the pleasure to invite uh, Steven Umbrello to join uh, us. Uh, Steven Umbrello is the managing director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. He's a postdoctoral research fellow at Delft University of Technology. He studied the philosophy of science and technology at the University of Toronto, epistemology, ethics, and mind at the University of Edinburgh science and technology studies at York University and ethics and design of artificial intelligence at the University of uh, Turin, Italy. His research focuses more broadly on value-sensitive design, its uh, philosophical foundations, as well as uh, its application to novel technologies like artificial intelligence, nanotech, and industry 4.0. Welcome, at John Cabot. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. And your book not only is prophetic, but it is really a tour de force, mostly because it's clear and I think accessible to anybody who's willing to engage with it, with even, you know. You already discussed, and this is, I think, a poignant part in your book, is that 
there has to be some sort of trade-off. There's not going to be a perfect solution. You said that in order to attain what most people would consider to be um, a, a necessary requirement for happiness, so uh, better health, right, which would require a sort, of, a sort of national health system, there would require a certain level of abdication of data. Now, you argue for a form of algocracy, so governance by algorithm, in order to avoid, I think, what you would say would be the corruption of people. I think that this functions on a certain level of good faith by those designing these systems, those implementing these systems, and then the beneficiaries of these systems. So before I critique you a little bit, I want to set the stage a little bit of what's happened, at least within the American system over the last few years. And I know that you take a very Eurocentric approach to give that. That's probably the, the best model, particularly when the other ones may be the Chinese model, probably the, not the most you know, attractive one. And the American model is no you know, solution either. And that's the one I'm going to focus on a little bit now. But I think that it does pose per, a potential threat. So back in 2019, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, also known as EPIC, filed a FOIA, which is a Freedom of Information request to the United States government. There was a meeting in 2019 by the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, which was a commission founded within the 2018 National Defense Authorization Act. Most people know that as the NDAA. They received a positive response from the FOIA request, and the document was released by the government. It was a PowerPoint presentation, one that would probably shiver to your bones if you read most of it. The focus of this document was, and this is to quote, to ensure that the United States maintains a technological advantage in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other associated technologies related to national security and defense. Robert Work, who was the former Deputy Secretary of Defense, described the Commission's purpose as determining how the United States national security apparatus should approach artificial intelligence, including a focus on how the government can work with industry, that's the key work with industry, to compete with China's, to quote, civil military fusion concept. The presentation was called the Chinese Tech Landscape Overview, and this uh, Commission on Artificial Intelligence promotes the overhaul of the United States economy and way of life as a necessary for allowing the U.S. to ensure it holds a considerable technological advantage over China, as losing this advantage is currently deemed a major national security threat by the U.S. national security apparatus. This commission is headed by Eric Schmidt, Google's former CEO. This is a, what is fundamentally a merger between big tech and the security state, which is nothing other than fascism, at least as Mussolini described it. So I think we could probably take that for its word. To confront these issues that the United States sees as a threat, the Pentagon decided to join forces directly with the United States intelligence community, not surprising, in order to, quote, get in front of Chinese advances in artificial intelligence. So they created the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, which ties together the military's efforts with those of the intelligence community, allowing them to combine efforts in a breakneck push to move government AI initiatives forward. They identify several issues in the United States that are what they call less common in China, and these are called legacy systems. What are these legacy systems? Well, a financial system that still uses cash and card payments, individual car ownership, even receiving medical attention from a physical doctor. It states, this document, that these legacy systems in the U.S. are good enough, but many good enough systems together hinder the adoption of new things, specifically AI-driven systems. The document says that there's a level of public-private partnership in China that is outwardly embraced by the parties involved. So the 
the public side and the private side outwardly embraced this partnership, with this serving as a stark contrast to the controversy around Silicon Valley selling its product to the government rather than outwardly embracing that type of synthesis. Examples of this controversy with Silicon Valley from this commission's perspective likely include Google employees petitioning to end the Google Pentagon Project Maven, which uses Google's AI software to analyze the footage captured by drones. And Google eventually shut down the program, decided not to renew it as a result of this controversy, even though Google's top executives view the project as a, quote, golden opportunity to collaborate more closely with the military and, and intelligence communities. The document also defines another aspect of the government uh, support as clearing of barriers. And this term is used regularly in the document with respect to the United States privacy laws, despite the fact that the U.S. national security state has violated these privacy laws with almost complete impunity over the last few years. So I guess my question to you is, is these products, for example, AI, are often looked at as products, or some people look at them as services, but fundamentally what they are, given their pervasiveness over time and over space, they are infrastructures. You rightly argue that in order to compete with states like China, for example, if we don't want to abdicate totally to a state like that, and we don't want to retract entirely, there's always going to be an opportunity cost. It fund it's fundamentally predicated on a good faith argument when we have what is fundamentally bad faith actors who actually possess the political power and capital in order to control these architectures. So if we do abdicate that and don't want to become the playground for China, I'm speaking of Europe in particular, if we do want to abdicate certain amount of our privacy, how do we, how do we ensure that it's not appropriated by these bad faith actors? Yeah, that's an extremely important point. Actually, just realized sort of when we, there were the discussions on using AI um, for weapon system, there was this, this discussion on, among very various countries, sort of should we ban autonomous uh, autonomous drones? And basically, what were the countries which were against it? It was the United States, it was Russia, it was China. All the smaller countries here in Europe, they thought, no, we should... We should ban them. We should ban the development, and then suddenly find out. Well, China has actually already—that was two, three years ago—already developed them, and then they sold them to Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and now it was also used already last year's war in Azerbaijan, I think. Those, so, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and they're using them in the Ukraine right now. Exactly. Sort of, you release the drone, they stay up in the air, um, they can, and then they. They can wait there, and once they de de uh, detect the, the target, it can it flies directly in, into the target and destroys it. This is so we already They've have been them. used in Yemen as well. Huh? They've in been Yemen. used by Saudi Arabia in Yemen as well. So this is where, and I think they got them from China in, in Saudi Arabia, as far as no, from the U.S. From the U.S. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so it's, this is a central question. And this is exactly the question also concerning um, sort of positing us and how, should we, how we should deal with digital data um, and the development AI. And, and what are the consequences for Europe in that respect? Um, if we realize, and what I mentioned before, sort of the um, um, data as being the new oil, it's closely connected with the financial well being, with the economic flourishing. And once you have the economic flourishing, or once you have the money, sort of also, or in order to develop military systems, you need the money in the first place. And we in Europe, we don't allow, we've got the GDPR, we don't allow the collection of these data, we don't, which really undermines the possibility of our, you know, using the digital, personalized digital data for the various tasks. And I'm extremely scared of the economic consequences for Europe in that respect. And without having the money, um, you cannot also in the same way invest in the military defense system, develop these autonomous, um, uh, uh, autonomous uh, weapon systems and so on. And what happens then with the countries 
we actually do collect the data and then use the data for military purposes, um, well, it's they who have the possibility to also expand, use the military in order to expand their political systems. And if I see sort of the, the, the possibilities, I, I, sort of the possibilities of China and how they are embracing AI in all the various fields, actually yesterday in class, I, I showed a video how, how, how in education AI is already being used, where they monitor personally, mon in some classes, uh, uh, they monitor the attention span, the concentration span with headbands. They, they, they embrace every aspect of the life world by means of AI. And so, um, and that means that has consequences for their financial well-being, but also then the military expenses and consequences for the expansion of authoritarian political structures. And that's what I'm extremely scared of. And that's why I think we need to rethink the meaning of how we deal with digital data. And that's why I think this is one of the most urgent issues we really have to embrace. And that in particular, um, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a region like Europe, which takes so much care on privacy, on protection of digital data. Uh, Stefan, if you allow me, I would like to Sorry. ask a question to both of you. Uh, to what extent the pandemic and the gathering of uh, data uh, with the green path, especially in Italy, uh, actually affects what you just said? You know, we are actually, everyone can get our data because of the green path in Italy. You want me to respond first? Or you no, go you first? go ahead down there. Are you asking my personal opinion on the green pass or? <laughs> Not on the green pass, just the fact that so many data, personal data are gathered at the moment and anyone can you know, ask us for a green pass and get your, our data. So that was exactly my point. I think we, uh, what something like the pandemic or any type of crisis means that when we make a, when we try to balance certain values, for example, like privacy or expediency. So, you know, there's probably a good reason when there is some sort of crisis that we sacrifice certain values that would hold back innovation in order to protect what would be, you know, the, the great, the greatest number of people opens up to the creation of infrastructures that could be easily appropriated by what I described as bad faith actors. Many of these infrastructures that um, these companies, because if you actually look at the board of directors of that commission, they come from not only national defense, but we have Microsoft on the board too. We have Facebook on the board too. And then we have Raytheon on the board, right? It doesn't seem like a normal mix, but you have the people who make the, the bombs, right? So we have everyone on these boards who appropriate systems that were in place for other reasons, because technologies are dual use. I have very little faith that a system, for example, like the European vaccine passport, even in the event that COVID is eradicated, which is unlikely, will remain in place either for the use of future pandemics or for other means, but that data is already out there. So this is the risks of creating infrastructures that can be easily appropriated by bad faith actors. And there's a lot of bad faith actors. Yeah, can you write yourself as a Novax? Because this is one of the arguments of the Novax, in Italy at least. Yes. So, so what do you want me to say, sir? Are you a Novax? Can you define yourself as a Novax? By, so. Probably by the, the, defin the, the revised uh, dictionary definition, despite the fact that I am vaccinated, yeah, I probably would be considered a Novax because I'm against government mandates. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Actually, the bad faith actors is, is what you were asking about. That. I still want to respond to it. Um, but first, coming back to the health issue. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of part of the argument of us having always been um, a cyborg. So trying to show that, well, our first upgrade, we don't get rationality, capacity of language from some divine spark, but it's actually, it's a parental upgrade. Our, our, our family, our parents, teachers upgrade us with language. Then we go to school and then we develop further. We get further upgrades like mathematics and history and sports, music. These are upgrades where they help us to live better lives. And, and the same we do with vaccination. That's a further upgrade. It, it's and all been done for the purpose of, of increasing the chances of us living better lives. And if we analyze that in detail, what I've done in the book is, is sort of, no, genetic modifications is just in tune what we as human beings have always been doing. It's, it's using a technology in order to increase the likelihood of us living good lives. And if a, gene, a, a genetic modification um, enables us, to, is, is done in a reliable manner, um, then we should have the right to do so because this is what we as human beings have always been doing. And 
sort of coming back to the um, to the to the to the, to the, to the prices argument uh, collecting digital data and I think by by collecting collecting digital data is a necessary prerequisite for 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 progressing with this manner in the appropriate manner because we need even more data so um probably in the future i mean in this in Sweden you already got the possibility of having your your chip as a passport implanted in in, in your body um and 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 that will it's not a big issue in the end, no. And 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 it's nice. You can never lose it, even if you can't have it stolen, and so and you can have. Um, but that could also analyze further your your biometric data, and you find more correlations between your biometric data and and your gene or biometric data and well-being, biometric data and, and and health and flourishing, how you respond to drugs, and so on and so on. And by collecting all these data, we find more information concerning which genes have which consequences, and then. Uh, or which lifestyle also have which consequences. And by having, by getting, collecting all the information, we get further, further, further insights concerning correlations. That's a necessary prerequisite for then using that with genome editing for CRISPR-Cas9 for the gene scissors. So, and so that's, that's, we need, these are the most promising ways. And then the question that comes, if we gather all the data, what about the bad faith actors? Um, and we have the data all collected. Um, I'm terribly scared of that. I'm terribly scared. It could lead to a totalitarian state of unprecedented scale. But on a pragmatic basis, we have no other option. It's an as good as it gets ethics. We need to do it because we live in a globalized world. And I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer to that. Because this is, you that's, you know, problem. that is, that is the best. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's what we need, but we need to do it. And we need to protect the data as well as possible, though that it can't be used against the individual. So that's why it should be processed by algorithms primarily. I'm not that, I'm, I'm extremely terrified of that as well myself, but I think I have, so far, I've not heard a very good, a good, a plausible counter argument against that suggestion. Yeah, it depends on where you, which countries <laughs> you're talking about, well, because exactly, I yeah. mainly work on non-democratic countries or countries with very low level of democratization, so um, the Middle East, and I'm thinking of the consequences for countries such as China. You know, if you don't have the green pass, you cannot go grocery shopping and so on. You cannot move around. You cannot uh, get money from the bank. So it's quite scary. I'll uh, thank you so much. It has been a uh, uh, powerful insight. <laughs> now I would like to invite Professor Maurizio Balistreri. Uh, he's an Associate Professor in Moral Philosophy at the Department of Philosophy and Educational Sciences, University of Turin. His main research interests include uh, robo-ethics, AI, bioethics, meta-ethics, Norma, normative ethics, assisted reproductive technologies. And I just quote one of your books, the one which, is, uh, which will uh, come out soon by Fandango, The Best Child, Genome Editing and Parental Responsibility. I look forward to listening to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, Stefan. Thank you for John Cabot for hosting this uh, wonderful uh, discussion. Um, I intend, I want to, to discuss uh, um, the attempt of uh, Stefan Sortner to combine Nietzschean moral philosophy, uh, liberal thinking, the value of freedom, and a focus on the value of uh, minimizing organic and uh, cognitive suffering. And Sortner says that uh, we cannot uh, refer to objective and universal principle uh, or moral uh, paradigms, because what is right for me could uh, be wrong for you. Indeed, what is right depends on what people uh, want for themselves and other people. In line with uh, uh, Nietzsche's philosophy, Sorkman said that the good is what is uh, in the interest of or valuable for each type of personality to live a life which correspond to their own psychophysiological demands. Whoever listens to his own drives and lives accordingly, says Sorgner, embodies virtues because in them the will to power can find its immediate expression. 
I am not sure that uh, before uh, the unprecedented technological development that for the first time allow replaying human nature and our children's genes uh, reflection on the responsible use of, techno of uh, biotechnology may be given up. Sorkinen is right when he says that we should recognize the existence of a radical plurality of the good, given that human beings display very different perspectives, lifestyles, preferences, and desires. However, unlike Stefan, I don't think that it is impossible to put forward considerations regarding the moral or a more responsible use of enhancement and uh, uh, new reproductive technology that may be objective. Indeed, once we have access to technologies allowing the modification of human nature, we will be able to condition the life of the people we bring to the world. It will be ingenuous to think that parents' love and experience suffice to face these scenarios and that it is, and that it is not necessary to take further the question of responsibility towards the people we bring to the world. It is not simple to establish what type of responsibility we have towards those we put into the world, but this is precisely why we should not circumvent the problem, but analyze it in all its complexity. Obviously, the parent's choice must be free and aware, but this is not enough in that a responsible parent should pay attention to the consequences of their choices and, for example, not have a child born who could risk having a life that is not unlivable, but still full of torment and suffering. Even though we are not obliged to select or bring to the world the best child, we should not perhaps make do with our children simply having a life worth living, in that life can continue to be worth living even in a condition of extreme suffering. Ensuring the child born with a good chance of having a good life seems a more responsible solution, at least in those scenarios where parenthood is a question of choice and not destiny or imposition. It is, true, it is true that uh, any discussion on moral responsibility may seem superfluous if we start from the idea that no genetic condition restricts the chance to have a good life. This is, for example, the position defended by those stating that disability is nothing but a mere difference. There is a dangerous rhetoric says, for, ex for example, Rosemary Garland Thompson, accompanying the debate on genome, genome editing techniques, which prevent reasoning in a correct way on the right and the duty to turn to them. Indeed, it is not true that these procedures are always desirable because they would spare the one coming into the world suffering or adversity that would otherwise limit the opportunity and condition their life forever. The thesis is that the disability will never be defects or disadvantages, but mere differences. They say that uh, disability are features like sexuality, sex, and race. If they make existence much more difficult, this is only depends on the fact that social prejudice encourage stigma towards the disabled, or at least makes it more difficult for them to achieve full integration. However, Stefan is a metahumanist who strongly defends the value of genetic modification intervention, so he should consider a parent's choice 
not to turn to this technology morally debatable. Yet Sorkin seem more interesting in stressing freedom, negative freedom, rather than responsibility. The value of freedom seems central, especially in choices regarding only the agent. But even this scenario, there appears to be room for reflection on the theme of moral responsibility. In fact, according to Alan Buchan, Buchan the very reasons justify obligation for education can also justify obligation for genetic modification interventions designed to improve personal abilities and disposition because every citizen has the capacity to be an effective participant in social cooperation. This is not the place to embrace Buchanan's invitation and ask whether a liberal democratic society may be morally justified in imposing a program of human bioenhancement. Um, what uh, um, here we, uh, we want to, to do is to outline, what I want to do is to outline that the question of moral responsibility is far from marginal, and that any discussion, reflection should not be limited to defending the value of negative freedom. Thank you. You're raising an absolutely <laughs> central point, of course. Um, so is it is my focus too strongly on the individual? Does it miss out on the responsibility for future generations, maybe also for the ones who are less well off, socially less well off today? Um, and it, it, it's a question of sort of what is actually, what has, what has its strongest impact for future generations? And so what now being discussed is always climate change is, is obviously carbon dioxide emissions um, as, as one of the major issues which will have an impact on, on sort of the future um, development of climate warming and so on. And what leads to that climate change, or one is one of the driving factor, again, we come back to the issue of reproduction. Um, any human produces more carbon dioxide, you know, produces an enormous amount of carbon dioxide emissions, which again challenges, you know, brings, increases the, the, the warming effects and so on. So how should we, if, so if we want to, if we, we're concerned with the, with the lives of future generations, well-beings of future generations, how should we address it? Wouldn't we have to intervene with the issue of reproduction, even even the quantity of in, uh, uh, reproduction further. These could be issues which are being raised. No? And these issues um, which, which need to be taken seriously, not, on the, not only on the individual choices, but only sort of on quantity of how many people one should have. Um, how many children? That's the China, the one-child policy, which, used, which is uh, luckily abandoned again uh, nowadays. But... Um, and one issue which is normally which is suggested in these consequences, and we need to convince, we need to encourage, we need to make people aware of their choices concerning reproduction, and then then they by themselves will make a decision not to have so many children, which again will will reduce the challenge related to overpopulation. But that's not really working out. In particular, if the people are, you know, if if if. Uh, I mean, we just see it, 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 convincing people of that doesn't have a sufficient amount of effect. In particular, if you're not so well off, you, you have more children uh, in a way to guarantee the future of your quality of life. So, so just doing advertisement doesn't seem to do the proper job. Um, another issue would be to raise, to implement then what could be a way of regulating the overpopulation issue. Do we want to implement eugenic practices? This is not what we want. This is terrible to what, what China has been doing or to what in, in, in other countries where we, we implement Saudi Arabia where is, is, is obligatory for some parents before they get married to have a, to have a, a genetic screening whether concerning the genetic compatibility. These are not issues which, which in a liberal, democratic, pluralistic society should be implemented in order to take on the issue of responsibility even further. 
Well, we need to, I, I see sort of overpopulation and reproduction is a major driving force, climate change, uh, global warming and so on. So how should we, how should we deal, that, deal with that? And I'm, I'm quite fascinated by actually by the research by Max Rosa. He's a German economist based in the St. Martin School in, 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 at the University of Oxford. And what he's been doing, what he's been, his studies, actually Bill Gates, he's a very young economist, mid-30s or something, but he built up the um, Our World in Data, one of the most fascinating websites where you look for, for all, you know, data information. Um, Bill Gates referred to him as one of the most important economists uh, in the world. And I think well, he's done a, a wonderful studies in which he showed that, so there, there, there are four different steps concerning population development. Um, sort of the better off a, a country is, the more educated there are, the more hygiene is present, the better the school training is, the better off financially um, uh, the, the, the people in question are. That has consequences concerning the reproductive choices of the parents. And um, basically, the higher the quality of life, better educated, more hygiene, more ac access to drugs, that reduces, and then automatically the reproduction rate drops. And actually, according to his studies, it's, it's likely that the 12 billion person on Earth will never be born if we continue with the development concerning innovation and technology as we've been doing in the past, in the past, in the past decades, uh, centuries. And so this is, so that would be a way so here, actually, transhumanism and the focus on innovation, the focus on developing new technologies um, is actually a way to dealing with the responsibility issue. To, to, uh, because by increasing the quality of life in the various parts of the world, that will lead to a, 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 a reduction of the reproduction rate. Um, and if even so, the less well-off countries are also being increased that it will have the same consequences as the studies have shown as now have taken place already in countries like Pakistan, South Africa, who've already increased to an enormous level, which has consequences on the reproduction rate. And um, so um, by, by focusing on the free development, on the development of the new technologies and so on, we don't need to implement um, eugenic structures. We don't need to un unsuccessfully convince people and that so we've got a good reason to claim that thereby we are acting actually responsibility. The qualities of life of the people in the various countries will get improved and the reproduction will get, get lowered, which again has consequences concerning uh, uh, climate change and global warming. And that's, that's sort of the best. That's, that's, that, I think that's a very convincing and very, very plausible uh, analysis he's presenting. And that's why I think, no, by doing so, we actually do embrace responsibility and that increases the quality of life of people all around the world. May I add something, do you mind? Uh, regarding Saudi Arabia, I agree with you, it's terrible, the fact that the families need, a okay, couple needs to do a genetic screening before, but I think, before getting married, yes. but I think it's the reason behind it is uh, to discourage uh, marriage between first cousins, which is, happens so often in the Middle East, even in my own family, I'm Italian on my mom's side and Iranian on my father's side. So the previous generation, my parents' generation, used to get married. They were first cousins getting married. So it's so dangerous. And it happens so much in Saudi Arabia as well. That's one of the reasons in Iran normally people are not obliged to do so, but they do so because they are scared of uh, having kids uh, with uh, problems. And I think that the main reason that one, trying to discourage this sort of, but getting married uh, between first cousins is also a way um, to protect uh, daughters. Because if they get married with first cousin, they stay in the same family. So it's a way to discourage violence. So it's complicated. Would you like to add yeah, something? Tomorrow we will have a lot of uh, technologies allowing us to enhance uh, our children. Is it a moral imperative to enhance our children? Or is it, or it is just uh, a possible choice for people? Uh, we need to look at a specific example. For example, if we've got a, 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 a technology, if we find out by genetic analysis, for example, there's a correlation between gene-specific genetic correlation and a 
30 year old longer health, health span, longer life expectancy, a healthy life expectancy. If you have a specific genetic constellation, if we, by means of some genetic technology, maybe, maybe genome editing, which can be done in a reliable fashion, and, and we, we've progressed immensely with respect to the genome editing uh, possibilities. Um, what would that lead to? So you've got, you've got the possibility um, on a reliable fashion, and the technique is very cheap, you know, modification like $30, um, um, to, to have a 30-year-old longer life expectancy. Um, that, is, that is an enormous advantage on the, on the, you know, as, a, as a positional good in the, in the comp competitive world. Um, it is very likely, I mean, even the question might arise, we've got a reliable technology, it's cheap. In Europe or with, within the public health insurance systems, it would probably even be covered by the public health insurance as a possibility, as an offer. Would it be negligence of the parents not to embrace it? Just in the way, you know, we've got a reliable technology guaranteed that the child lives 30 years longer, just in the same way with the vaccination. And then, then really this becomes a question. That becomes, and, and we've, we've, we've had the advantage with these questions in the past. Um, we've had these issues in the past, for example, um, the same issue could be right. So if we, um, if we develop autonomous cars, should it be prohibited to have a human driver? Um, and we will, if we look back in history, it's just to the beginning of the 70s, um, in all the lifts, there was a paper, uh, there was a lift boy, a lift girl. Um, there was always someone assisting you. Why? Because it was dangerous to use the, the elevator, the lift, without, without human assistance. But then the automated, the automated lift system became so safe and so reliable, no one's sad about not having a lift boy or lift girl anymore. We don't even think about it because the advantages and the system is so reliable. So I don't think it will even be an option if it turns if a technology um, is is reliable, cheap, and it will it will provide us with a significant benefit. Um, there is not even much of a question. It's moral or, immoral, or it will simply be most widely adopted. Thank you so much, Stefan. Thank you so much. I would like to invite Professor Pier Giorgio Donatelli, uh, Professor of Philosophy and Head of Department of uh, uh, Philosophy at the Sapienza University here in Rome. Professor Donatelli has written on the history of ethics, contemporary moral theory, bioethics, and on issues related to human life, as well as on Mill, Wittgenstein, Foucault, and Cavell. Among his uh, recent publications, Manière d'être humain, une autre philosophie morale, uh, 2015, La philosophie et la vita ethica, published by Naudi, 2020, The Politics of Human Life, a Rethinking Subjectivity, Routledge, 2021. The floor is yours. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. So thank you for this uh, very nice invitation and really an uh, honor to discuss uh, Stefan's uh, book, uh, which is really you know, thrilling, interesting. As, I mean, many things have been said already, so I'll try to be very quick. So I really enjoy reading it, Stefan. And I, 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 I have a few notes here. And I basically, I am in a large agreement, but also disagreement. So I'll try to stay also with the disagreement. But let me say a few things uh, on the things that we agree. So I, so I actually like the way you frame things. So actually, for example, working since the beginning on the on a, on a kind of a naturalist uh, um, assumptions that you frame in a very nice way with the idea of impermanence, which is obviously also religious. And so I like the way in which you say, well, whatever is of value for us now, it has an origin, long time origin. Like the origin of the <laughs> cosmic of the of the world, or the or the solar system, or Earth, or us, modern and contemporary, and then there will be a future, and so we need to be able to square up things, and so think that whatever has value, intelligence, autonomy, morality, uh, whatever is of beautiful spirituality, is something that has an origin and that will die out and be off. So I like that. I don't, but I won't say anything. 
now. Uh, I don't actually like the way you frame it as ethical nihilism. So this nihilism is not me. So I think there's a way in which you can say that everything is impermanent, contingent, coming from an origin and going to nothingness and still hold on to the fact that we have knowledge of reality and that we can have a, a true representation of reality and then we can also have uh, uh, good things in the world. So you can have objectivity and impermanence together, but I won't say anything about this. So I have a different view on that. So I, I, in any case, I like this kind of impermanence <laughs> way of framing the problems. And uh, I also like uh, uh, starting from impermanence and possibly pessimism, uh, like Schopenhauer, et cetera, uh, because many people are working on pessimism, Benatar, all these people. So they're actually saying that we should get out of the planet as soon as possible, not killing ourselves because that's evil, but uh, extinguishing humanity as soon as possible. So I don't agree with that. And I think you have a very positive attitude, which I like, especially, this was actually a joke, especially even though it is very much discussed by philosophers nowadays in analytic existentialism, especially um, the positive attitude to what I think are goods, actually, at stake now with the war in Ukraine. That is a kind of liberal scientific humanism we have inherited as the West, which we have been educated to say this is very bad by the social sciences and by progressive ethical and political thought. I am a progressive, so I want to say this, but this kind of you know, intellectual environment is educated to say that the West is bad and the liberal scientific humanism is bad. No, it is good. So technology, democracy, political cooperation, human rights, this is all good. So I, sorry, I'm being a little bit emphatic. So I, I, I also agree with this a lot. This is the spirit of the book, basically. So I just love this. And uh, where do I disagree? So I disagree actually with, uh, so I actually have a philosophical disagreement. So I'm not sure how much it is substantial also because I don't really work a lot on this. So I'm actually learning for you as a matter of fact. So the, the disagreement is basically substantial on your own, on your understanding of uh, what it is, this kind of package, a liberal humanistic. So this liberal vision of life, what is it? So you spelled it out. This has been said many times this evening, this afternoon. Uh, it has, you spell it out, uh, you gloss it as uh, um, negative liberty and appreciation of the pluralism of the conceptions of the good life. So basically, anything goes uh, as it matters to the conception of the good life. Anything goes. And you say anything goes, meaning anything in accordance with our, I have notes here, but I go anything in accordance with our psychophysiological drives. So maybe there's some Nietzsche there. I don't want to say anything about that. So anything goes as a matter of uh, um, conception of the good life and negative freedom, obviously, which means that you are free. And so anything goes, but I cannot harm you. Okay. So that's the idea. So I think, uh, so I say this maybe very, very quickly, and I just again finish, but I, I give you a, a couple of examples. This doesn't work. <laughs> that this kind of normative platform, this normative theory won't do the trick of defending what you want to defend. And uh, I say this very, you know, bluntly like this. <laughs> Obviously, we need more, more time to discuss this in detail. So what do I mean by this? So for example, you have very nice examples. So, so the idea, obviously, negative freedom is to eliminate unnecessary suffering in the laws, in the regulations, the morality, and leave people to form and follow coherently their own conceptions of good life. So anything goes. Uh, but this can be said theoretically, if you go to the details, everything becomes more complicated. So for example, you say um, that we obviously we need to make, this, make a distinction between, say, rape, so rape is wrong, and same-sex couples or incest as well are right, or say conformism is wrong and autonomy is right. So let, let's stay with this thing about sexuality. So rape is wrong and same-sex couples and incest are right. I think... Among, obvious, ob, 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 obviously, no, no, but I won't, uh, it doesn't scandalize, I actually agree with you, so Pierre, I agree with you, 
So the problem for me is how do you argue for that? Okay, that's the problem. So I think in the first place that this is not a Steve Stefan. Sorry, I have speaking English. I have the Italian in mind. So Stefan. So let me pronounce your name with some kind of correct German accent. Uh, Stefan says that uh, anything goes means to have a, a, a formal, non-substantial conception of the good life. So my contention with you is that this kind of distinction is very substantial. It's not a formal distinction. So you, you need to have a, a, a concept of the good life, which is very thick, as a matter of fact, in order to argue for the distinction between rape, wrong, and same-sex couples, right. This is very easy. Of course, we know this, because this is a very recent, actually, acquisition, and we just need to change nation or also look within this same nation to, to actually have, find people that have a conception of the good according to which this distinction is not in place because obviously our contemporary notion of rape let's stay in the heterosexual setting uh, is very recent and actually we thought that it was totally normal a kind of violence within the heterosexual couple and so that didn't count as rape, and so it was totally okay. Whereas same-sex couples was horror. So T Thomas Aquinas, it's a vice against nature. So complete horror. The notion is horror. Uh, so, okay, let me say something else. So this is a substantial and not, and not non-formal. Second, in my view, but I think I need to finish in a couple of minutes perhaps, so I have my view on these things that I cannot now actually go into, obviously, which is that how did we uh, come to have these kind of distinctions in place? My view, I'm basically on these things, a million, million from Mill, John Stuart Mill, the 19th century British philosopher, is that you need experimentation. So you, you need to have a liberal democratic society in which you experiment styles of living and then you mutually, reciprocally learn from each other and then, for example, you experiment sexuality in new ways and you actually experience and you actually learn and you actually evaluate same-sex couples' sexuality as something which is actually enriching our idea of intimacy and sexuality. Whereas, at a certain point, you experiment and see that what we counted as normal was actually rape against women. So you learn, and this requires experimentation. So, Experimentation is something very, again, that you need a context. So, going back to your issues, the thing is that if we, if our society is going to change dramatically, which is the topic of your book, and it is, it's going to change dramatically carbon and digital ways, maybe we won't have, this is actually a very contingent and genuine question, we won't have a society which will let us experiment in ways that actually are the ground of these distinctions. Whereas in your book, it's like these distinctions are fixed and then we simply have to apply them. But we also need to learn them and earn them through substantial, in a way, and a reciprocal learning about conception of the good. So you need thick conception of the good, actually conflicting and mutually learning from each other. And then you earn the possibility. If you don't have the appropriate context, zero, you don't learn anything. So I stop here by saying this. Actually, we are still living, I think, with your kind of liberal views that I endorse completely, in the shade of gigantic, huge transformations that actually Western societies experience in two decades, 60s and 70s. Those are the decades of sexuality, abortion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and now, actually, things are changing. And so the question is, if things change a lot, we won't be able to hold on to these distinctions or to new ones, which we will need. So I stop here, Stefan. No. The book is wonderful, <laughs> but my disagreement is also strong. Yeah, no, I just said one thing. You mentioned <laughs> Thank, the 1960s and 70s, but actually... Until 1996, rape was a crime against morality in Italy. So it was quite recent. Thank you very much. Yeah.
And in Kyrgyzstan, in Central Asia, one woman out of five today, according to the UN, gets married after being kidnapped and raped. And uh, two years ago, it was one woman out of three. So thank you so much for sharing. Maybe we are more closely together, even philosophically, than you might have sort of presented it right now. And let me try to convince you of that. Um, the important issue is sort of when I, I do stress, negative freedom is a wonderful achievement. And we, 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 we shouldn't forget what an enormously wonderful achievement it is. From a historical perspective, where political, politicians, religious leaders have told us how to live our lives um, in the Enlightenment. And, and this is, it, 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 it's, it's wonderful that we have realized it. And I think we haven't realized it sufficiently. It should be expanded even further. But it is an achievement, which means on a fundamental basis, I mean, I don't claim epistemological superiority. Negative freedom on a, on a fundamental basis is no, in no way better than any other value, than other, any other normative system. I don't claim that it's better founded. That's, it's a, it is something which I affirm, and I'm very happy to live in a society where many people think that negative freedom is a wonderful achievement. What it actually means, uh, precisely what it implies, always needs to be reinterpreted. Always the cultural circumstances need to be taken into consideration. And, and sort of negative freedom doesn't mean also, it is not, I think it, it, I, I think it is, is the most fundamental, the most important achievement, sort of in the sense that we individually, even though individually we are all constituted out of our historical cultural context, but it's important that we are not being legally forced to stick to a specific understanding of the good life. And, but that doesn't mean that one doesn't have the right to impose limitations. If the, if the, if the, if the gap between the rich and the poor gets too big, that undermines the freedom, and even the negative freedom of the poor. That means in the name to guarantee that the poor are not being forced to take on specific labor they want to do. You know, that in order to preserve freedom, one needs to limit negative freedom. But again, in order to do so, but that need, in order to preserve freedom, one has the right to, to limit the negative freedom. Um, for a certain time, until the situation then has become better again. So one needs to take the context into consideration. And in the same way, that also um, means maybe with respect to some of the issues um, you mentioned, same sex, incest among consenting adults i you know i've taken a bit stronger view um, and and on the basis of widely shared widely affirmed value judgments in our society what we should embrace but at the same time it's with respect to some other examples i try to show no we always need to take the individual cultural circumstances into consideration uh, um, Negative freedom, as long as you don't harm you know, a, a, another person directly. That, what that does it mean? What about the issue of male circumcision? Male circumcision at the beginning of life. That could be seen, and in Iceland and in, in, in Denmark, political rules of uh, reflections have taken place to make male circumcision illegal. And maybe on the basis of a country like Iceland, and Denmark, it is possible to have discussions on this issue. In a practical circumstance, that undermines the possibility of Jew Jewish and uh, Muslim religious life. And, and uh, um, that, again, in a country with, with the German history, the, the, the talking about the banning of male circumcision would have completely different implications. That's why in, in Germany, with the German cultural heritage, that couldn't be discussed that couldn't be properly discussed. Whereas in Denmark, in Iceland, in this cultural context, without that specific history, that would have a completely different meaning. So I'm, I'm not actually taking a clear, this has to have that implication or that. No one does need to take the specific cultural context into, into, into consideration, adapt them. And isn't that what you were sort of in the end? Uh, it's, I think <laughs> it's more foundational what I'm saying, but maybe we don't have time because uh, let me say this in a very abstract way it's like uh, you uh, separate uh, 
normative dispositives, uh, normative mechanisms like negative freedom and pluralism from the shape of society. What I'm saying is that they are interconnected. In if society is going to change a lot, having, for example, the normality of genetic enhancement and and uh, and use of, of data on a, on a massive way, either way, European, whatever, uh, if the society changes so much, maybe there won't be any more the conditions for the values that you actually care for. And so this is just an absurd argument, and this kind of argument is not in your book, so this was the criticism. We might not have any more the conditions for actually caring for the kind of liberal values that we care for. If it is normal, in, so actually this was great, somebody, even Maurizio before, or also, also exactly. So this is also a problem. And actually, at one point you said, sorry, um, Jennifer, Merchant, yeah, you said maybe it's too late. So maybe it's too late, I don't know. So I began, so let me in a way contradict myself. I have, I have a positive attitude, so I have a positive attitude. But maybe, maybe, maybe it's already too late because uh, I don't see this kind, because, okay, let me add something more, then I stop here. This kind of values, at the end of the day, were actually forged in a very specific context. The combination of uh, uh, democracy, human rights, and technology and science was something specific happening in Europe in a certain moment. We, also, we already see China doing, wanting to do something else in detaching science and technology from democracy. And so the conditions make the possibility of this kind of experiment work or not. So I am not, in this sense, I want the argument of negative freedom and shape of society together. You cannot separate them. Can we say that we cannot take liberal values for granted? This is also yeah, important. We, we, take it for, we take it for granted. This is very wrong. There are specific, thick, not formal, thick conditions for the existence of these values. And we need to fight for a certain kind of civilization, broad enough, obviously, but you need to fight for something specific, not formal, because the formality won't do the trick. And what is going on in California, I was absolutely amazed by the conversation with Father, Father Larry before, is for me very scary. Because from what you, you two said, there's a new religion coming out, I'm, I'm a non-believer, but if I need to decide, I stay with <laughs> traditional Christian confessions and Catholicism. <laughs> like it's, I agree. it's a very you, minor defense, I'm sorry, yeah. Father. But <laughs> this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, super, super rich uh, religion in which your personal death is everything. And millions of deaths of people starving for, for hunger is nothing, is really bad. Ethically, very I agree in the sense, I, I, that's why I cherish negative freedom. It's just an achievement. It's not an essential norm, which is valid for all times in the future. On the basis, however, and this is where maybe we differ, on the basis of our cultural context, on the basis with our history, with our, our cultural historical location, this is what I cherish. This is what we cherish. And that's the only thing why I'm advertising for that, why I'm showing, let's expand that further. We need to embrace that. We need to work on that. It's an advertisement. It's an advertisement which is valid for our times. I'm not sure what will, I think it's, it's I can't see sort of, I, I, I can't play, I've got my own historical location embeddedness. I don't know what will happen, in particular when it comes to the metaverse, the digitalization, that will have enormous implications. But that's why I think, um, yeah, maybe in the future that will be not applied, but based on the understanding we have and what, which we can always see, that's as good as it gets. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Donatelli. Uh, we have the last speaker. Sara Chan is a reader in bioethics at the uh, Asher Institute, University of Edinburgh. She's currently deputy director of the Mason Institute for Medicine, Life Sciences and Law, and an associate director of the Center for Biomedicine, Self and Society. From 2005 to 2015, Sara Chan was a research fellow in bioethics at the University of Manchester, 
first at the Center for Social Ethics and Policy and from 2008 uh, to the Institute for Science, Ethics and Innovation. Her research interests and publications cover areas including the ethics of gene therapy and genetic information, enhancement, research ethics, stem cells, animal ethics, transhumanism, and the ethics of science and innovation. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Let me first of all offer my congratulations, Stefan, on your excellent monograph, which I very much enjoyed reading. Uh, thank you to you and to the organisers for this opportunity to engage with some of the ideas in it. Uh, and let me also offer my apologies for arriving so late. It was entirely out of my control. But I'm very glad to be here. In this brief commentary, I would like to observe um, one, what I think is a key insight of, the, of your monograph and to reinforce it with some arguments of my own and then to propose two very small extensions to the way in which you've characterized transhumanism and how it could apply to today's society. So when we ask, what is transhumanism? We're really asking two things. We're asking, what is it to be a transhumanist? What values, principles, and beliefs are typical of transhumanism or what, what principles and beliefs should a transhumanist have? And we're also asking, what is it to be or to be becoming transhuman? Like you, I can find little better answer than uh, Huxley's formulation of the transhumanist imperative, that of humanity attempting to over overcome its limitations, the realization that both individual and social developments are processes of self-transformation. And of course, the idea of the transhuman is also closely associated with the idea of the species transition, a form of evolutionary becoming that will ultimately produce uh, a new species or, or perhaps multiple new species of post-human or Nietzsche's over-human. But transformation into what? What or who directs or should direct the process of becoming? And what I thought was one of the key insights of this monograph was that in adopting the framing principles of alethic and ethical nihilism, I'm not sure whether I agree with the terminology, um, but I think that in adopting these principles, it proposes a sort of procedural transhumanism that refrains from specifying the individual values and traits that are likely to be enhanced as part of the process of transhuman evolution. And instead, it emphasizes the importance of social and political principles, such as negative freedom and equality, in enabling us to achieve progress individually and collectively towards our own diverse ideals of the good life. Now, I think this approach to transhumanism has much to recommend it, as I'll go on to discuss. I think it's potentially somewhat at odds with the evolutionary biological account of transhumanism and the idea of the transhuman posthuman species transition, at least as these are commonly understood and as you discuss in chapter four. Um, and in fact, I think this intellectual tension is precisely one of the aspects uh, that I think recommend your approach. But consider the Nietzschean account of the overhuman species transition as you describe it in chapter four. So you say to increase the likelihood of an evolutionary step occurring from human to overhuman, certain, a certain amount of human beings must reach the boundaries of the human species. When we say the boundaries of the human species, what boundaries do we mean and in which direction should we be reaching them? Um, and as, uh, as you go on to say, Nietzsche's exposition says, well, if the few reached the upper limit of the boundaries of the human species and the many were at the lower end, that might push us closer to the sort of tension that would propel a species transition. So this idea that there are somehow upper and lower boundaries presumes a sort of directionality to human abilities and capacities. So it does presume, in fact, that there is some objective account, some objective access of what's better or worse what conduces more or less to a good life, and therefore what a good life in fact is. And that to me seems in tension with the claim about alethic and ethical nihilism. Now, this, is, um, this aligns, I think, with the criticism that I previously developed with respect to what we might call um, strong pro-enhancement thinking of precisely the sort that has been identified with, though not necessarily explicitly self-identifying as transhumanism. So exemplified by such thinkers as John Harris and Julian Savulescu, the principle of procreative beneficence, the moral obligation to enhancement. Now, this line of thinking that we, that we should always be improving ourselves and that there is a fixed direction to improvement, I've argued derives in part from the historical roots of the bioethical debate over biomedical and biotechnological enhancement. So because enhancement came from therapy, 
in order to defend the idea that enhancement as well as therapy is morally legitimate, in order to erase the significance of that distinction, these arguments have tended to reject the moral significance of the normal. So it doesn't matter whether you are um, conducting therapy and taking someone from below normal to normal, it should be equally um, acceptable, it should be equally obligatory to take someone from a level of normal up to a level of supernormal. But nonetheless, in establishing that direction, they privilege the normal over the subnormal and the supernormal over the normal, and thus the only way is up. More is always better. Now, this view of what it is to be improved can in many ways be coercive, and I'm very much in sympathy with your criticisms of Savulescu's uh, principle of procreative beneficence, very much in sympathy with the affirmations of diversity as legitimate and, um, and authentic. And I liked very much uh, where you gave a number of examples of ways of living that we might think of as contrary to what we would want for the good life. Somebody who wishes to die, somebody who wishes to um, eat parts of their own body, someone who doesn't want to be cured of depression, etc. And I'm going to quote because I really liked this part. You say, by claiming that these wishes represent insane states of the mind, these persons are treated paternalistically and in a violent manner as their wishes are not recognized as theirs. And I think we can see parallels here with, uh, for example, um, John Harris's account of the harmed condition, which I will paraphrase, he, he views as um, a condition in which one would have a strong rational preference not to be, so disability, things like deafness, a condition in which you would have a strong rational preference not to be. The effect of this definition is, of course, to judge irrational. Anybody who says, actually, I'm perfectly fine, I have a preference to be in this condition. So, as we can see, Prescriptive ideals of the good life too often can quickly become coercive. In fact, if anything, preferences and ideas of the good life that diverge from the norm should be treated as less suspect in terms of their likely authenticity rather than more. Decisions that conform with the norm are more likely to be the product of outside pressures and of uh, societal norms rather than of individual authentic decisions. So, as I said, this idea of radical plurality, of diverse notions of what can, what can be a good life, is one of the aspects that most appealed to me in your account of transhumanism. Importantly, this extends not only to a diversity of bodily forms and, and of functions, but also of social arrangements. So, in I think it's in Chapter 2, in the discussion of privacy and the threat to privacy that a datafied society, the internet panopticon, might pose. Um, Stefan, you mentioned a number of what we might call taboos of the past and present in, in relation to the way that we organize our personal lives. Things that might be thought to be, I think you and I don't think they are, things that might be thought to be legally, morally, or institutionally reprehensible. And you mentioned homosexuality, polyamory, and incest in roughly decreasing order, perhaps, of social acceptability. Now, this put me in mind, first of all, of um, Nicholas Agar's claims in Humanity's End, his treatise against radical human enhancement, that there are certain quintessentially human experiences, this is what Agar argues, certain experiences that, he says, are typical of the ways in which humans live and love, and that these would be lost by becoming post-human. And I think it's a salutary reminder that we do not all live and love in the same way. But in any case, um, as you say, in no social order are the rules without flaws. There's a risk of sanctions for actions such as homosexuality, polyamory, and incest that are not necessarily morally problematic. And so the question is, what ought we to do faced with such flaws? What ought we to do about what I think you delightfully describe as the encrusted structures of our Christian cultural past? What do we do about these encultured structures? So I think, and this is where I want to slightly build on and extend uh, your, your idea here, what we need to achieve the transhumanist vision is not only or not primarily a biotechnologically mediated physical evolution, but a collective socio-political evolution towards the sorts of structures and systems that enable the realization of the core values necessary for transhumanism, such as negative freedom and equality. Um, so I propose that uh, towards this end, we view law and social structures as a form of political technologies um, of regulation. So analogously to the biotechnologies of medicine that modify the physical human, te political technologies act to shape and modify our idea of the social human. And I think we can apply a similar sort of positive pessimism to law as a technology of society. 
So Hobbes's view of the human condition, as you say, is a pessimistic one, and the appropriate political technologies can help us to overcome this. So how do we develop such technologies, if we want to call them this? How do we go about generating new socio-legal knowledge and applying it to develop the, uh, these technologies of law in a positive direction? So law, of course, evolves through a combined process of deliberate, deliberate reform and iterative reinterpretation, propelled both by shifting collective social norms and also individuals who dare to go out on a limb and challenge the law in court and say, I want to live my life in this way. Why shouldn't I do that? And so one thing that occurs to me is that do we perhaps have a duty to assist this process by challenging social and legal institutions that represent obsolete technologies based on outdated social knowledge? And we could do that either overtly by bringing legal challenges, by seeking or demanding review, or we could do it implicitly simply by living our lives in ways that do not conform with the institutions with which we disagree, ways that push, if you like, on those contingent nodal points that we think need re-evaluating for their local truth value. Now, it's absolutely the case that some living under oppressive regimes where there are sanctions for failing to comply with social norms and where these are severe, it would be a disproportionate burden to challenge those norms and to live differently. So for many people, doing so comes at great personal cost, may involve damage to professional reputations, may involve either danger to life, either from the state or from violence by individuals. So, for example, many nations still have the death penalty for homosexuality. There are, in, even in liberal countries, increased rates of violence against LGBT people. And we cannot demand that people live their values in order to achieve progress where so much sacrifice would be involved. But, on the other hand, that makes the obligation, I think, more pressing on those of us who are privileged to live in already more liberal societies and who have the personal and, and political resources to sustain such a challenge. So I want to suggest, some bioethicists have suggested that there might be a moral duty to participate in scientific research. Now I want to suggest that there is, if not a duty, perhaps a light moral obligation um, for us to participate in, and I'm glad that you brought this up, to participate in Mill's experiments in living, where to do so involves no great cost to ourselves, that we owe it to society to help to develop in, in that way. The very last point that I want to make, and this is the second small extension that I want to propose, relates to who the subjects of transhumanism are. Need they only be humans? So if transhumans are beings continually engaged in a process of becoming, including through the use of technology, if it's a collective social process of technological becoming that involves the reflective negotiation and interpretation of bodily, social and material norms and the political structures via which we give those norms effect, what are the implications for how we steer those, that process, not only for ourselves, but for others at times when they're not consciously able to direct their relationships with technology? So, for example, children and future generations, but also, for example, non-human animals. Um, now, you, you briefly do address the idea in the monograph that we should consider extending personhood beyond the human. Um, but I think one, one area in which we could perhaps go further with that is to develop the notion of non-human persons and what that would actually entail to include non-human animals as part of the transhumanist imperative. So a final way, perhaps, in which the transhuman and post-human species transition might come about might the present identity of our species be, be altered not by any biological or cognitive changes to the members of whom we presently consider to be our species, but by a reinterpretation of the species concept itself and its significance? So instead of thinking about the human species, do we need to recognise our moral species? You say we have always been cyborgs, and I want to claim that we are already post-humans, or at least potentially so, not only in our relationships with technology, but our relationships to each other and our recognition that the we of the post-human community may be broader than we previously thought. Thanks very much. You know, we're mostly in agreement, no? I can yeah. see. So, um, so what about the moral duty to, to move into a specific direction? You mentioned the examples now, uh, interest, um, Polly Amory, what else was it? Um, uh, I think you had homosexuality as one homosexuality. that we, we like to think is mostly accepted these days, but as it's, I say, there are places where it's it's still not. Exactly. Now you're, you're um, about the moral duty. I wouldn't I wouldn't 
formulated as strongly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because the thing is, and, and I think that's part of actually the Fatima, the Pensiero Deboli, weak thinking, the, in, in the end, the understanding that even those sort of the, uh, negative freedom as an achievement, as a non-essentialist, it's not a final insight. I might be completely wrong with what I'm saying. You know, everything I'm proposing and I'm realizing this might be, maybe there is a truth corresponding to the world. I'm not, ex I can't exclude the possibility. And that enables me an, an, an openness to the other's perspective. So um, even though I'm, you know, the things I've, I've been proposing in the monograph and the directions, I, I have arguments in favor and I think they are, they are well-founded and they're plausible. Um, but on the other hand, I'm aware that anything I'm, that's this ethical nihilism, no? Um, uh, I'm aware of, of, of being able to take a distinct thing myself from, from my most cherished insights and normative claims. I might be wrong without, with respect to anything I, I, I'm claiming, if there is a notion of right and wrong, which I, I doubt uh, again as part of the book. So, and that enables me. Well, that 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 is not that that is more sort of the implication. One should enter into dialogue, rather than into an, uh, rather than into sort of the moral duty to work on a specific direction. I'm, and the dialogue, um, I think, sort of the moral duty implies more of a, a, another hierarchy. This is actually better founded in the direction I want to go to. Maybe that's not entirely necessary, but I, I'm thinking, yeah, it's better founded for me, but there's no epistemological better foundation for what I'm proposing. And so entering a dialogue means basically I'm... I'm, 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 I'm encountering the other on, a, on an equal basis, on a non-hierarchical basis. Um, and that, that's why I'm, I'm sort of a bit more hesitant concerning the notion of moral duty to make it move into a specific direction. Uh -huh. So uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I think you're right. We are largely in agreement on a lot of these points. And as I say, I, I really enjoyed reading the monograph, not least for that reason. But let me clarify a couple of points in relation to this um, and I will say, I, I resile from the claim about moral duty, and I think what I said was a light moral obligation, um, because I think, as, as those of you who followed these arguments will know, in fact, to try and make a claim that there is a moral duty to take part in research, is, that's, that is a very strong claim, and it's hard to defend in a watertight way. But if we step back and we say, well, there are good moral reasons to do it, you would be doing a good thing. Um, so we can kind of get away with that, right? Um, but the other thing I want to clarify is that I'm not saying, so in fact, two things. I am not saying that we should all engage in the experiments and living even where it doesn't suit us to do so. So I think this connects a little bit with uh, what you were saying about, you know, ought we, ought we to do these things even where they don't align with personally with our ideals of the good life. I'm not claiming that either, nor am I saying that we should live our lives in these ways because they are better. So the the duty or the obligation or the moral reason to engage in experiments in living is not because those experiments will be better, it's because we don't know. It's because we don't know if they will be better and we don't know if a society that permits these is likely to be better, but we think it might be. So I'm, I'm using a sort of loose analogy here between think about the sorts of changes that propel regulatory and social innovation and changes in our beliefs about pluralism and what sorts of lives can be good lives and think about the way that we do scientific research and how that propels the development of scientific innovation and how we use that to create the sorts of good lives that the social and political thinking carves out for us. Yeah, so it's it's not nearly as strong a claim as you, you may have interpreted it to be. No, this is something, no, this is something I, I, would, I agree with. Sort of with no, that, what I, that's basically what, what philosophy does, but what, what good philosophy I think I can do, it's... it's, it's um, it's a reflection on the good. Going back to Plato, no, the highest ideal is the ideal of the good. And Nietzsche, it's, it's, a it's a fight about values in the end. It's a war concerning values. It's, this, is, this is what, in the end, all the philosophical reflection come down to you. Um, and, and, and you enter into the dialect, you present something. And maybe also in certain circumstances, I quite like, actually, maybe in certain circumstances, one needs to be focused on which which fights which 
which debates you should really get into. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe it's also good just to refrain from it. I sort of remembered sort of the story from Spinoza. I think you know, he was encountered by some, some friend of his. Now you're a philosopher, tell me, you've, you're so, such a critical thinker. Tell me what I'm doing wrong in my simple life. And he said, no, you just continue doing what, what you've always been doing. I don't want to disturb you with, you know, with this, this disrupted thought. That might also be the suitable thing to do in certain circumstances. So, but maybe, but when it comes to when it, in particular, when it comes to political legal issues, then I think yes, I'm, I'm, in, in, in also concerning public attitudes, concerning mm -hmm. moral issues. That that's why I think it's it's good to not only to engage in in, in classrooms and to to discuss the various public, but also in, in the public. Also, they have engagement with policymakers, politicians, entrepreneurs to go out because these are the ones where the driving force is, uh, make, where you can make a lot of happen, open up the eyes, which has further implications. So, but always in the sense of, a, of an equal dialogue, in the sense, I think I've, I've got good reasons for what I'm presenting, but always without trying to, to strongly impose it on the other, in the sense, um, without being too forceful. Yes, I which I think is a yeah. I suppose when we're talking about contested values or contested ways of living, um, you often come from from. It's very hard to approach it from a position of equality because you are often approaching it from a position of perceived inferiority. So there, there's a little bit of a sense of having to punch up in that. But I agree that ideally, it's it's not about saying my view is better than yours, but let's engage as, as equals. Um, I, I will tell you one other reason. I I am cautious about making an argument for you should stand up what you for what you believe in is as i alluded to for a lot of people that comes at a great personal cost um and you know today by the way is the is trans day of visibility i'm not sure if people know that um and a lot of my trans friends are saying it's great that there's a day but we're tired of having to be visible every day um but i think for that reason because there are already so many burdens faced by people in these situations um in fact it makes it even more important as a matter of justice that where people like me and you can stand up as academics and say, let's let's live these values, let's speak up for what we believe in, because we've got the professional resources, the political resources, and the social power to make those arguments and have relative safety around us. That's why it's important that we do that. Perfectly. Well Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to open the floor uh, to Q and A for uh, Stefan, please. Would you prefer to gather yes. two questions or uh, to answer one by one? Feel free, free to. We have, have ten them. minutes. So, and also, we can get up to questions on that as well. Yeah. There will be. And maybe also, if there are questions uh, uh, remote from the remote audience, yeah. yeah, they would have the chance to ask the questions now. And they could be considered. Please. Not so much a question, not just the uh, viewpoint. Um, what are your I'm not, I'm not, if we look back in, 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 in the history, so just in the history of the Enlightenment, um, it was actually quite a lot of active engagement which was taking place. But the interesting thing, the, 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 the actual changes only occurred, not if they occurred on one level only. It was not only the philosopher, it was not only a politician, 
It was not only uh, uh, engineers or inventors who actually brought about the change, but it was also the people going out on the street. So it was being part of a being part of a movement, being part of a wave, being part of the spirit of the times. That's I'm mean, the question. The um, so my my thinking, as 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 you've heard, sort of I'm, I'm drawing a lot on Nietzsche. Actually, dealt a lot with Wagner, and that was part of the exchange between Nietzsche and Wagner. Um, both of them. And this is where I where, where I differ from them. They they were very critical of the nihilism of our times. I think the nihilism is a wonderful achievement. We should embrace it and develop it even further. I think nihilism is, is, is that's what the non-essentialism, getting rid of all the encrusted structures. But um, Wagner and Nietzsche thought that is problematic. We need to overcome nihilism, and they had different ways of 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 of, of thinking how it can be overcome. The Nietzschean response was um, well. It is, it is a strong leader. It's someone interpreting the world and the cultural creator who brings about and then brings about the change in the rest of the population. Whereas actually Richard Wagner was, was, was aware um, it could only come from the people being part of, of something which is, which is already occurring. And um, I mean, in the end, I guess it's, it's never... This is still no dualistic thinking. It's never an either or. And we can see this developing occurring nowadays in the same way as 50 years ago, it was, I mean, 50 years ago, um, uh, say, uh, homosexuality was still, still a criminal offense. Now this is in wide parts of the world, this is seen as absurd. I mean, people talk about, it's not only same-sex marriage, uh, even um, same-sex marriage doesn't seem to be sufficient enough in the sense um, because yeah why why should you limit it to two people um why why shouldn't i mean that's that's even in the interest of a you know a, a, what, what what's the foundation of marriage it's it provides stability if one person gets ill then the other person needs to financially take care of the other and that's in the interest of the, of the government of a political system and um if, if 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 there were more if it was a contract among more people then that would still be in the interest of the government um, because it reduces again the financial spendings of the of the government, and that's so marriage is just a contract among a certain amount of people, and that's in Colombia they've actually realized that already, and there's been granted the marriage among among three men, um, which which is quite a significant change. So here, in the same way as a significant change has happened with respect to sexuality in the past fifty years, we can see a lot of happening. I think. Um, uh, concerning how we treat animals, um, how we, not any kind of animals, how we treat in particular the further developed animals. It's not about flies, it's about pig, it's about, about cows, it's about um, sheep. Um, and, and, and in the way how animals now are being treated sort of in the, in the, in the animal factories um, and slaughtered, mostly people, if you see that, you at least become a vegan or you know, for a couple of days. <laughs> um, and, 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 and you see the development, how we're developing further, 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 further technologies, further uh, food alternatives. It comes up in entrepreneurship. It, it comes in the companies, in, in, in bio, biotechnologies. And more, uh, so vegan, vegetarian lifestyle is, is becoming more and more popular. And now, I've, I've, six, seven years ago, I, I, I met a, Met, a, met, a, met someone in, in Taiwan um, who was sort of creating some, a vegan cheese, on the, a real vegan cheese based on, based on a genetically modified uh, yeast. But genetically modified yeast uh, creating lactose, and with lactose it's a proper cheese. Um, and, and, and you get the taste of a real cheese, but without any uh, using any animal products in the end. And that has a lot of potential. So I can see because it's happening sort of not among a lot of people, not only among a lot of people, it's among the people who cherish climate, you know, try to undermine climate change, the treatment of animals. I can imagine that in, in 50 years time, sort of we, we will look back upon our times, you know, how, how cruel and violent have they been then, you know, then at the beginning of the 2000s um, of having, you know, slaughtering millions of animals you know every 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 week in, in these animal factories so it's that's that's why it's not just the individual and it's it's a sort of spirit of the times coming together without having any further explanation but it's not it's it, 
but some public engagement is also needed. <laughs> Any other question from uh, the public? Should we close our yeah. symposium? It's been a long night, no? Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long night, we need to have a dinner. Yeah, I will just conclude with a short sentence. Liberal values should not take and be taken for uh, granted. You know, we are in Rome, we are in Europe, and uh, most of the countries where I normally travel to, you know, they don't share the same values and the same rights are not granted by their political systems. That's all on my side. Thank you so much for joining us. In, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations again for your book. Thank you. Thank you again, Rebecca. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Bye, Rebecca. Bye, Rebecca. <laughs>